First on our agenda is consideration of the agenda. Uh, Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no additions or changes. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt, adopt the agenda as prepared? Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. The agenda as prepared will be our schedule for the day. Uh, next is a selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed up to three minutes to address the board. The completed sign up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. Um, and Ms. Schaefer is both going to pull the names and read them tonight. That's going to be double duty. <laughs> Joel Sales. Yara Cheek. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Marley Clark. Diana Bergman. Sorry, Bergman. Bosch Ferron. That's it. Very good. Our next item is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board, and the system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing uh, processes as appropriate. Uh, I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Uh, please conclude your marks when you hear the bell or see the time has expired. <coughs> Our first speaker, uh, is from TABCO, and that is Abby Baton. We've already done the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> that didn't count toward my time. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, evening, Chairman Gillis and Ms. White and members of the board. First, thank you to Chairman Gillis and Ms. White for your thoughtful words this weekend at the TAPCO ESPBC Legislative Breakfast. The crowd was very appreciative, and thank you also to the board members and BCPS staff who were able to attend and have very important conversations with our members. Happy New Year to everyone. Tis the season for resolutions. Unfortunately, we most often don't follow through with many of those promises we make to ourselves. I hope some of the resolutions we make on behalf of the students in Baltimore County have a much better chance at being followed through to fruition. We understand that we need to teach our students to be persistent, to use grit and determination to ensure their success. Now is the time for us to be role models and demonstrate for our children what that looks like in a real life setting. We must demand the resources we need to help our educators do their jobs. We together must push to for the human and financial resources we need for this most important work. Our students are watching and learning lessons from what we do. We must make sure we are letting them see the importance of that follow through. On another note tonight, you will be dealing with a contract on a new learning management system. While we are all ready for stability and less change from what our teachers were, uh, from what our teachers who appraised the new schoolology, I'm gonna say this wrong, schoolology, schoolology systems, thank you, schoolology system, I've heard it two different ways now, reported it is worth making this change. Our staff has struggled with the current in-grade system because it was unable to perform without several go-arounds or folks having to use other products at the same time. Tom Dehart and I saw a demonstration yesterday and were impressed with the ease of use and intuitiveness of the product. Our folks have been asking for a system like this and while one wanted, when no one wanted to change systems, it became apparent we could use, we could continue to use N-Grade, and our folks would never obtain a system that works well for them. This change will help our staff not only perform duties without the go-arounds with which they have had to deal, but with speed, agility, and many more functions. The key, as usual, is the rollout. 
The plan is to have the product in the teacher's hands by the beginning of the fourth quarter this year. They will have time to use it and have staff development well in advance. We will hold BCPS officials to that timeline. From our discussions, they too understand the necessity of following the timeline as well. We have pushed for true collaboration with the system. It has begun. We still have a long way to go, but all sides agree for our students we must work together. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Board of Ed members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. First, we'd like to recognize and honor our longtime secretary, Georgie Clevenger, who passed away right before Christmas. Georgie helped so many PTAs and in turn so many BCPS students through her decades of service on our council. She'll be deeply missed. Our next general meeting will take place on Thursday, January 25th at 7 p.m. at Cockeysville Middle. All are welcome. In, ad in addition to our meeting, there will be workshops for presidents and treasurers. If anyone has an issue that like they'd like to be addressed, please contact us. We'd like to report that we, rec we received an extraordinary number of submissions for the National PTA's Reflections Arts Competition. The entries are, entries are now being judged at the county level and winners will be sent to Maryland PTA in a couple of weeks. The FY 2019 capital budget will be presented tonight. PTA Council would like to reiterate our belief that all students de deserve a safe learning environment. Baltimore City schools have been criticized in recent local and national news because of the lack of heating. Conditions were described as inhumane, and they certainly were. We'd like to point out that unair-conditioned schools with heat indexes of over 100 degrees are also inhumane. We hope that very soon all BCPS students and staff will be able to work in schools with ad adequate climate control. Finally, another achievement report from Johns Hopkins will be presented tonight. While we haven't had the chance to dig into, fig into the figures to the extent that we in the public are even able, we do have to point out that statistics can be skewed. Averaging the test scores of 10 schools when a number are extremely high achieving and others are low achieving leads to a false measure of success. The trajectory of each school needs to be mapped out versus offering an average. We hope that map, school, map scores for all schools can be made available too, so the public is able to see how scores compare. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Julie miller Brett. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. Happy New Year to everyone. We are looking forward to a great year working with BCPS. We ended last year on a high note with our December 13th meeting with Superintendent White. The GTCAC has identified five areas of growth for BCPS in relation to its gifted and talented students. They are one, a system-wide need for increased knowledge and accountability regarding GT learners. Two, improved classroom delivery of instruction for GT learners. Three, acceleration options. Four, enrichment options. And five, communication with stakeholders about GT identification programs and services. The GTCAC also provided 10 recommendations that we believe would help make improvements in these areas. Ms. White was able to speak to our group broadly about each of these identified needs and our recommendations. We very much appreciated the thoughtful conversation that our group was able to engage in. Upon reflection, we believe that one group that should be targeted in regard to improving GT throughout BCPS are the principals. As instructional leaders of the school, it is a principle that sets the tone and focus for each of the individual schools across the county. We routinely hear from parents about very disparate situations at schools. Some are very aware of their GT population and proactive in providing solution for students who are ready and capable for more, while others are not. Some schools tout their GT programs, while others do not. Some bring advanced academics in at helpful junctures, while others do not. We believe that one solution to more consistent messaging about GT options in the school system could come through having the staff of the Office of Advanced Academics present two to four times a year at principal meetings. This would not only give principals a firm knowledge base about advanced academics, but would also be a good place to field questions um, about individualized situations 
sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. Um, it could also uh, help the office um, the office can help in individualized situations while also contributing to a more equitable, equitable distribution of information about advanced academics and how it works, which would hopefully filter down to parents. I know too that the Office of Advanced Academics is in the process of setting up a communication structure in order for principals to regularly receive key information and that the office is also looking into setting up meetings with individual principals throughout the system. We are thrilled and highly supportive of these initiatives. Another very positive development in terms of communication is the new recommended learning management system from Schoology that I believe you'll be speaking about later this evening. I had the privilege of being part of the, that review group and during the LMS presentation it was immediately evident how well the Schoology platform lends itself to the creation of collaborative groups that could share information back and forth. I immediately thought of how this could be utilized by the Office of Advanced Academics to share information and how advisory groups such as ours could also utilize it to great effect. I believe it will become a very highly utilized resource. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Case, Tom DeHart. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair, uh, well, he's not here, so I've saved some time. Uh, <laughs> Superintendent White and members of the board. Last month, I addressed the board and quoted a widely recognized belief that leadership matters. Tonight, I would like to add that leadership is learned. BCPS, like most school districts, select highly successful teachers to be assistant principals, highly successful assistant principals to become principals, and often the highest performing principals to become executive officers who will supervise and evaluate principals. Our system provides support, coaching, and mentoring for the APs and principals to help them develop and hone skill sets for effective instructional leadership. We have a system disconnect, however. When we promote people into the role of principal supervisor, we ensure that they receive the necessary compliance training, such as legal issues and employee discipline, but make the mistake of assuming that the same instructional leadership skill set that they use so successfully as principals aligns to their job as supervisors. These are two different skill sets. Research agrees that today's principals need support for their development and growth. The role of the principal supervisor has shifted from compliance monitor to coach. I would suggest that that is done in a purposeful and collaborative fashion. BCPS has 16 staff in the zone offices who collectively supervise principals. To be sure, there are some who intuitively get it. Their primary goal is to support and improve the principal's capacity for instructional leadership. They form relationships that build a foundation for coaching and support. They engage in effective professional learning strategies to help principals grow as instructional leaders. I talk with these principals. They feel empowered, motivated, and excited about this growth mindset model. In other instances, however, some of our principal supervisors are perceived to exhibit a definite top-down mentality. Principals do not see themselves as part of the collaborative process. School visits create anxiety and apprehension. Little effort is made toward building relationship with the principal and administrative team. I talk with these principals too. They feel demoralized unmotivated, and are convinced that they're only as good as their next mistake. This set of principal supervisors are not bad people. In most cases, they simply do not possess the skill set to be effective principal supervisors in the 21st century. So they go to the old style leadership method of positional authority and intimidation. Education is and will always be a people business. Just as BCPS supports leaders at lower levels, we must ensure that staff in the zone offices have the proper training, support, and structure to do their jobs effectively and with a level of consistency and accountability because leadership is learned. Anything less is a disservice to staff, students, and parents. Thank you. And I have time left over so I can say Happy New Year. Thank you. Our, uh, it's now time for public comment. Our first speaker is Joel Sales. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I want to uh, voice uh, my concerns about a middle school in the, uh, the northeast sector of the county, um, considering the, the really harsh weather that we had this past week, uh, really having wind chills down to negative seven degrees. Um, it's my understanding that um, the doors for this particular school were closed prior to the normal operating hours. So the buses would 
uh, come by and they would drop off the students and then they would leave. So all the, the students would be out waiting outside for uh, 10, 20 minutes, up to 20 minutes um, in weather that is a nominal uh, seven degrees uh, wind chill factor. So um, I'm concerned about the fact that a lot of the middle schools in the county have provisions for situations of inclement weather, extreme temperatures and things like that. They, they make provisions of letting the kids in if they get there early, whether they're a car rider or whether we're on the bus. I don't know why a particular school is, is not allowing that to happen. It's my understanding that they don't have the resources to, to open up the school but um, I'll let the board uh, decide on, on how to resolve that issue. Um, another concern is, um, it's my understanding that if a teacher uh, had a child um, that went to the same school, that they were allowed into the building. So there was a little bit of a conflict there that there's, there's definitely an a understanding there's a need to have the kids in the warmer environment as opposed to waiting 20 minutes in below freezing conditions. Um, but that's not uh, apparently uh, made uh, aware to the point that the, the school can have a provision for that, whether you go into the cafeteria, whether you go into a gymnasium. Um, so I think it's maybe a staffing issue on their side uh, but I wanted to let the board uh, know about that and hopefully we can consider um, helping all the, all the schools be consistent with, uh, with making provisions for the kids to, to en enter in. Um, another uh, <coughs> concern is uh, the buses. Uh, I know it's a challenging situation, uh, even on days that you have delay, two hour delay during cold weather. Um, it's my understanding that sometimes buses are like an hour late. So um, that is unacceptable. I don't know what the solution is, but I would like to. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yara Sheik. Um, Happy New Year to the board and to Superintendent White. Um, I hope you got everything done at Christmas. We, we had spoken earlier about the frantic pace of things. Um, I, I know tonight the board is going to be voting on the high school assessment study, and I wanted to ask the board to include two items that weren't in the scope of work for, um, so that whoever is awarded the contract can consider them. One is the very important feeding pattern of middle schools to high schools. We have uh, ongoing pro uh, pr uh, construction projects in the Northwest area that are going to redistrict some of our middle schools in the Northwest area as well as Ridgely Middle School where I'm PTA president. And we would like the high school study to consider that, not to move kids to one middle school and then move them out from where they were originally designated in terms of high school. And I would say that because Ridgely Middle School feeds into three different high schools. We currently feed into Luck Raven High School, Towson High School, and Delaney High School. Second of all, I'd ask you to examine um, in the high school study, ask that it be that the facilities, the age of the facility that's not in the scope of work and the condition of the buildings be considered in the high school assessment. When they're planning, look at, well, if we move the kids here, yes, that may work, but what is the age, structure, and condition of that building that we're moving them into. And I think you did a good job when you looked at the middle schools of looking at buildings that might have structural or conditional needs and, and deciding to not use those and to use others. So those are two points. I would also say that Ridgely Middle School is currently the most overcrowded middle school in Baltimore County. We're at 115% capacity. We have 18 floatable teachers and four trailers. Our hallways are extremely congested. We had a botched renovation in 2008, 
and I would ask that you would consider some sort of relief for Ridgely Middle School, and if we could have that articulated so that we can relay that to our communities um, who are looking for relief. We grow to 130% in three years. So those are my comments, um, and I would ask that you add those two items to the high school assessment study. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marilee Clark. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, and Ms. White. I am Marilee Clark. I'm the principal of Lyons Mill Elementary School, and formerly I was the principal of Woodhome Elementary. Thank you for this opportunity so I can share some insights about our interim superintendent, Verlita White. I believe there is no need to conduct a national search for the superintendent position. I enjoyed the privilege of working directly with Ms. White when I was the principal of Woodhome Elementary. As my supervisor, Ms. White supported me in a leadership capacity. I am proud to say that Woodhome Elementary was named a 2012 National Blue Ribbon School during Ms. White's time supervising my leadership team. Many of us benefited from her instructional knowledge and passion, which was clearly evident with every interaction that she had with students, staff members, and parents. There were no cameras around. Miss White was just being herself. Verlita White is authentic. As interim superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools, Verlita White has charted a clear course setting up our school system for success. I trust her ability to continue to move our school system forward for Alita White is the real deal. Ms. White has demonstrated consistent excellence throughout her career. She represents a unique combination of being a homegrown educator with an extraordinary talent that we will not find anywhere else. For Alita White is a proven leader. I feel very fortunate to be a part of a community that values education for our boys and girls to be college and career ready. Verlita White is leading the way as we work collaboratively to create learner-centered environments where teaching and learning has been transformed. As we provide innovative environments filled with multiple opportunities for our students to learn and practice 21st century skills to be globally competitive, Verlita White is the clear choice to be our superintendent. Imagine a school system where teachers work together to plan staff development, problem solve, and analyze student data. Imagine a school system where teachers use synergy and creativity to build capacity for innovation. Imagine a school system where a collaborative culture and shared vision make overcoming any challenge possible. Imagine a superintendent who understands that improving academic achievement requires many components, extra hours, and always going above and beyond expectations. Thank you, Verlita White, for inspiring me and for your deep commitment to Baltimore County Public Schools. To our Board of Education members, I encourage you to forego a national search for the superintendent position. Our best candidate is right here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Happy New Year, everybody. It's 2018, and I made a lot of noise in 2017, but I'm ready for 2018, so I'm excited. I first want to start off by um, sharing my deepest condolences to um, Georgie Clevenger. I had an opportunity to meet her while I volunteer for PTA, so um, to her family, um, prayers and hugs. Um, of course, I want to talk about all the changes that are happening in 2018. There's a lot of a lot of discussion, a lot of things coming forward with the current commission doing their review of how we fund education. Um, the governor announcing recently that there's going to be an act to protect our our students, our students, and create a process for them that I believe in Maryland is lacking, and it's important that we have this. It's going to make us grow better as leaders. We learn the best when we fail and how we get back up and grow from that experience. So if we're in this to grow our students, to teach them to become adults, we got to teach them accountability and responsibility. And there's no shame in being corrected if it's going to make you better tomorrow and grow from it. 
we have to do better, how we educate. We always have to do better, not just today, tomorrow, and five, 10 years from now. <laughs> and I have a minute and 30 seconds left, and I, of course, I'm grateful for all the hard work that they did with the renovation proposal for Lansdowne High School. But guess what, guys? I still want a new high school. I really think our community deserves a new high school. There's some things that I still have a hard time seeing um, capacity for this high school. As our community grows and expands and it keeps growing for the next 10, 15, 20 years, even if we're all not still there, it's gonna impact. And we didn't change the blueprint. We didn't make those classroom sizes a little bit bigger. Um, we don't have extra, extra room. Are we making and moving forward the right decision knowing that so many changes are gonna happen at the state level as far as what is expected out of our school facilities? And we still have a situation before this construction project starts. When it gets 80 degrees and it starts to warm up, it gets 97 degrees at that high school. Just as bad as some of our schools. I heard from Franklin, um, High, is it high school and middle school that part of the building, the newer part of the building, had proper heating. The other part was a lot cooler. And we got to show our children that we own up. When we see something it's not quite right, that we could step in, lead, and correct. And correct. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferrone. They kept to the board last board meeting. Honestly, I didn't have time to go home and pick it up, so it's kind of late. But <laughs> may I present? You may present. <laughs> I can't eat them myself, so. Um. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, ice is scary. <laughs> You know, because that means slipping and a visit to the emergency department. Um, but, you know, too many times I think, you know, people are not happy if the school closed too early or opened, you know. And so what I really thought, and this is my, my thought to you as our board member in the coming budget, is to consider really making the school system 21st century as far as learning and communication. So if a family don't want to bring their child early and slip or anything like that, they can really follow the teacher and the teachings online through many of the available collaborative uh, processes uh, that we have. And I think this would uh, tie in into that we know we have limited number of days for education by contracts and so forth. And I really hope that you would do that. Um, one of my nurses was watching her uh, son in a daycare center um, by remote uh, into her Apple phone, you know, kind of to see. So I can envision that the people who don't want to come in because of ICE, they can basically watch the teacher teaching, uh, have some sort of feedback, et cetera. The second thing is, in my <laughs> one minute left, time runs so fast, is last year I praised Ms. Cozy and Ms. Miller for adding to the conversation and discussion to the board. Um, this year I really appreciate a third board member for thinking about the voiceless and the weak. You know, our farm students are really high. Uh, one out of six Americans are hungry. 50 million Americans are hungry. Many people are really relying on school feeding. And Mr. Virch, for me, watching the board for so many years, is the only board member that really stood up and spoke about farm uh, students and how they rely on the school system for feeding. So in your discussion, I always really want not only to recognize you for you, recognizing <coughs> those who really have no voice or little voice, but also to encourage all board members really to think about the people who don't really come here and don't have lawyers to lobby for them, don't have politicians to come and lobby for them, because all of us are really Baltimore County Public School. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is public comment on policies. And the first policy for public comment is policy 0300, basic board commitments, equal employment opportunity. And the uh, signed up speaker is Diana Bergman. <coughs> Hi. So when I looked at this, I thought it was pretty short, and there was a few things that I would like to suggest when we're looking at the um, equal opportunity for our employment um, when we have people that are going to be employed for BCPS and be part of the BCPS team. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's not just that they get the opportunity to to work in great schools, but the facilities themselves, they should have that learning environment in an, in an area that the, the climate should be um, reasonable and comfortable to work in so people um, could focus. Some of our students and some of our facilities that are not um, up to part because they're either lacking heating or cooling, um, you could see our students, they have to work twice as hard to stay focused academically. So what do you think our teachers have to do when they have to perform their skills? Um, and we're evaluating them all as they move forward in their careers. I talked earlier about some of our top teachers become assistant principals and they work up from there. Um, should they all start off at, at the same pace when we're looking at this? Um, who gets to decide if someone goes to teach new for the first time in a new building and who goes in a more challenging atmosphere? Um, I still think we need to also consider not just the skill performance too, but the environment that they're working in. Because I always believe if you have a happy teacher, you have happy students. So that's all I have to say about that policy. Thank you. Very good. Don't leave. Uh, the next. Uh Policy for comment is policy 3123, non-instructional services, financial reporting. No one signed up to speak on that. And the third policy is 6401, instruction, special programs, advanced academics. And Ms. Bergman, you signed up to speak on that. So our GT program is very close to my heart. I have a seven-year-old that um, earlier on I started noticing as early as pre-K he was showing signs that he knew above, um, beyond his peers' his age. And I kept trying to communicate that information with um, an assistant principal and the principals of, of our school. And they kept him busy and stuff, but I don't think he, they challenged him as much as he deserved to have access to. Over time, we were able to access that, but now he's in second grade and he keeps performing. Um, I hear a lot about the GT programs for our middle school and high schools, and it's tough. We have a very large school district and a very small GT program. And I think one of the number one things that we have to look at this policy is to make sure we guarantee that we, with such a small staff to support this program, that we improve that communication piece. We have to go beyond uh, not just ex informing our principals and assistant principals to access the resources for GT, but also to do a collaboration approach to inform the public because it looks very different as a child developmental milestones grow from when they come in from pre-K as they go through middle school and high school. And we have to make sure that we challenge every child and provide the supports, and sometimes you have children that are considered twice exceptional in the GT program. So when I look at this policy, I'm trying to look at and consider what guarantees that. And this policy is worded in a way that we're identifying as early as possible, and what tools are we required to use, a combination of tools to be able to identify these children and make sure that we share what's available with our GT program in Baltimore County. 
So I want to see something that will support to make sure implementation of those three things happen, that we improve communication, that we get this wonderful program out and shared. Um, special education has great resources. I think we should find a way to provide something similar along the lines to inform not just your principals, assistant principals, your teachers, all the way down to the parents in the community of what a GT student is capable of even supporting the whole classroom because they do end up being a lot, um, end up being very outspoken, strong leaders <laughs> at a very small age. So those are some things I think we should consider when looking at revisal of this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Miller-Brett. As you are all probably aware, the GTCAC has been closely following and working with BCPS staff on the draft of policy 6401. As a group, we find the currently proposed 6401 to be vastly superior to the previous draft, and we are very appreciative that BCPS so clearly took to heart many of the changes we strongly advocated for in the last iteration of this policy. Since this is the policy that will support gifted and talented students for the next five years, our goal is to ensure it is the best document it can be. With that in mind, we have a few tweaks that we think would make this good policy even better. In Section 3C, we would recommend adding a few words to the list of information that the board wants to hear from the superintendent to specify not only the student data that is currently listed, but other items too. For example, at the end of the section, add in, right after standardized test scores, and other information about advanced academic services, including status of professional development, curriculum resources, and recommendations for improvement. We believe it is appropriate for the board to receive annual information, not only about the numbers data pertaining to GT students, but also evaluative information. It mirrors COMAR, which requires evaluation not only of identification processes, but also GT programs and services. For further reference, see the 2008 policy the superintendent shall provide to the board a semi-annual status and growth report for the gifted and talented education program detailing disaggregated student enrollment retention and achievement curriculum and professional development program implementation and recommendation and recommendations for improvement also in section three we would like to see a new subsection e added Annually, each school shall, with the assistance of information supplied by the Office of Advanced Academics, provide notice to parents and guardians about the existence of advanced academic services, general information about the characteristics and needs of gifted and talented students, and resource lists. This is a piece of policy that would speak directly to parents and is a piece that is missing from the current policy. We believe this concept belongs in the policy as well as in the rule. It reflects our multiple encounters with parents who tell us that they have been told by schools that gifted services don't exist in BCPS schools, that there is no such thing as GT and BCPS, that nothing exists for advanced students, and that they didn't know there were supposed to be such services. Having the board direct BCPS staff to proactively provide information to parents would help close this information gap. Finally, the GTCAC was hopeful that in the policy title, BCPS would retain the phrase gifted and talented by at least having the name of the policy be advanced academics and gifted and talented services. Gifted and talented is the phrase used in Maryland statute and Maryland regulation. It is the phrase used in the school districts surrounding BCPS that are referenced in staff's policy analysis document, either in board policy or other system documents like handbooks or web pages. The word gifted is what is used in federal law. By giving it a new name, 6401 could cause more confusion among parents who already believe that GT no longer exists in BCPS. Parents actively search for districts with strong GT programs. So Thanks. Next on our agenda is the opportunity to hear from the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy New Year, everyone. I want to uh, take a moment to welcome our students to, and staff back to schools and offices and to ring in a new year of possibilities and opportunities. I hope that everyone enjoyed a restful break and that we're all prepared for a productive second half of the school year. Also, I'd also like to remind everyone that on Thursday, January 11th, we'll turn BCPS into a sea of blue because it is Team BCPS Day as schools and offices and communities celebrate Team BCPS Day 
today. Last year, we were trending on social media, so I look forward to seeing the pictures and videos of the blue hair and clothes and buildings uh, so that we can celebrate our school system and show our teamwork. So the hashtag is, team, is, is BCPS Blue. I'd also like to remind everyone about the two, 2018 Stakeholder so Survey. That Stakeholder Survey is our opportunity to hear from the entire community, including students in grades 3 through 12, our parents and staff, community members, about how we're doing uh, on in each Blueprint 2.0 goal area. It only takes about five minutes, and it will op it will be available in 16 languages um, for the community as well, and for students and for our parents. This survey will open on Monday, January 29th, and I encourage everyone to take the survey and help us shape our budget programs and staffing. So, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, next is an opportunity for um, me to say a few comments. On behalf of the board, I uh, also extend New Year greetings to everyone. Um, and indeed, being halfway through the school year is, uh, is a great milestone. Uh, we definitely know, based upon the past few weeks, that it is winter. Um, and I'm hoping that today is a good indication that the thaw has begun. Um, uh, it's, a, it's also a time for us to give congratulations where they're due to some of our own sung heroes. Uh, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Platt, Mr. Smith, thank you for keeping all those buildings open and for keeping the kids um, in a, a healthy environment. And uh, as Abby Baton said in some of her comments, uh, this past Saturday, uh, many of the board members and I had an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, our, uh, both our teachers and our support staff, um, and importantly also um, our elected officials. And as the legislative session is about to commence, it's an important time for all of us to know that uh, we elect persons to represent us, and it's always an important time for us to make certain that we speak to our elected officials so they know uh, how important education is um, uh, to, uh, to us. Ms. Schaefer, it's your turn. Good evening and happy 2018. I hope everyone had a restful break and are ready to tackle the end of second quarter. Before the break, I had the opportunity to visit Pinewood Elementary School to read The Night I Followed the Dog to Miss Rose, terrific third graders. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to visit and tour Pinewood to see all the amazing things that are going on in the school. It was fascinating to see how devices are used in the elementary school classroom. In a fifth grade art class, students use their device to look at an artist's body of work so they can copy their style in their own artwork. I remember when I had art in fifth grade, my classmates and I would fight over the books, and if you were too slow or last in line, you wouldn't, you'd be stuck with a book you didn't like. Um, I would like to thank Pinewood for inviting me to read to their students. I had a great time. Three days ago marked six months since I was sworn in as student member of the Board of Education. I am so grateful for the opportunity to represent 113,000 students, meeting so many bright students and teachers along the way. You never know how large the county is until you travel around it. I enjoy every school visit I attend. Each school has such a different climate than my own, and I am able to get a better grasp on how to represent our students properly. I've already learned so much from being on the board, and I am thankful for my fellow board members and staff for being kind to me, and I would like to apologize for talking about parallel parking so much. Um, <laughs> I am thankful for this experience, and as we begin the third quarter, I can't wait to visit more schools and be more vocal about student issues. So I am super excited to announce that it is that time of year again. Applications to be the student member of the Board of Education for the 2018-19 school year um, will be released on February 2nd. Being SMOB has given me a chance to experience Baltimore County in a completely different way, but I would not be seated here if I didn't have teachers and staff looking out for me. This time last year, applying for SMOB was not on my mind. I was preoccupied with midterms and the start of my internship. My guidance counselor pulled me out of class one day right before a test and asked me if I was thinking about applying. That was the first moment I realized I had the potential to be SMOB. Um, there are students in our system right now that have the potential to be an amazing student leader on the Board of Education, but maybe are afraid to take the chance to apply. Our teachers know us best, and just knowing that they believe in us go in a long way. I encourage teachers and staff to look out for the students in their building that they, could be they believe can be an amazing board member and help them take the leap of faith and apply. 
The student voice is an important tool for the Board of Education, and I know we, have, we will have amazing candidates this year. Rising juniors and seniors can apply for SMOB from February 2nd to the 16th, and we accept two applicants for school. I'm so excited to begin the SMOB process, and we'll keep everyone updated as we continue. Thank you. Thanks, Josie. Next on our agenda is item I, and it is policies, and time for a third reader. For that, I invite Mr. Virch to take over. Thank you, Ed. Um, Mr. Chair and members of our board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommended proposed amendments to the board of the following board policies. Policy 8130, policy formulation. Policy 8222, superintendent, executive officer, secretary, and treasurer. Policy 8230, orientation of new board members. Policy 8250, board member responsibilities. Policy 8270, board committees. Policy 8280, memberships. Policy 8311, meetings. Policy 8320, final action by the board. And the proposed deletion of the following policy. Policy 8312, public meetings. The proposed amended policies and proposed policy deletion are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit I. The committee considered public comments received at the board's December 5th meeting. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Although no second is required, we do need a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee. All right, there's a motion. Uh, any discussion? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just ask that we, um, that we review them one at a time because we have received comments from a board member, so I think it would be most efficient to go through each policy individually. Okay. So. Well, if I might just ask the member, like which policies have we received comments about? I mean, is it I all of these, anything. or is it? I have submitted comments on most of the policies. You have them in front of you, and I emailed them to the board members earlier today. I know we have nine policies, and there's a tenth for deletion. Or rather, there's nine, one of which is up for deletion. So are there comments on all nine? That's the question. Almost all nine. Well, it, it's all, is it nine? Is it eight? Is it seven? Or it, could it be four? It is more than half. So then it would be five. So I ask that we separate each of them. Which are the five? I didn't say five. It would be, I can take the time to go through, but really it's almost all, right. all of them. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll call them one at a time. Thank you. Is this appropriate? Policy Review Committee had ample time to review all comments, and anybody who had any comments had ample time to submit them. We spent a lot of time on these policies and bringing them forward, and then I think it's just totally out of order. There's four in this package. Turn your microphone on. I think it's totally out of order to bring projected changes uh, to these policies that we're presenting as a third reader at this time. All right, it, it is definitely a certainty that the board has known that these policies are up for comment since the time they were introduced for the first reader. Um, and uh, there is opportunity for the board members to make comments and deliver comments to the committee so that the committee can consider them because really this should be the work of committee and, and delivered to the board. That being said, um, I'm gonna run down them one at a time and uh, we'll have uh, a vote on either the amended comments that are presented or on the, on the, uh, the committee's uh, recommended uh, policy changes. The first is Phyllis. 8130. 
could, could I just respond to what, what the comments were on that? Um, because we don't receive, it's the, these um, proposed policy changes are not received, uh, or it's not posted publicly or shared with the full board until after the committee first meets. Um, it becomes impossible for the board members or the public really to participate in that first initial discussion of the committee, which is the most substantive discussion that the committee has on policy changes. And we've been through this before where board members have asked when it's appropriate and the target keeps changing. And uh, Robert's Rules of Order does um, address the fact that, you know, we are voting on this and that is the time to have discussion and debate. So that's why I'm bringing it forward now. Well, Ms. Miller, I think part of the frustration is that um, if you emailed something to, to uh, active board members today, likely they did not receive it. Delivered on my desk, I'm just actually seeing it right now. Um, so I think that's the frustration, and there's surely plenty of time between the last time when there was comment and this time for there to be delivery of information so board members could consume it. But we're going to now uh, consider 8130. Is Mr. there Chairman, any? If I might just just share some information with our colleagues, the first reader for these policies was November 21st. Now, I know the holidays are a busy time for folks, but I also note that the comments that were received from the public were received on December 5th. So, just so one is aware then of the timeline, that it isn't as though these policies have not been out and have not been circulated and have not been available for folks to read. If the chair's wishes are that we go policy by policy, that's that's fine with me. There are there's only one other choice, and that it would be to refer this back to the committee for consideration. Um, and if there is a desire to do that, we'll refer it back to the committee for consideration. Otherwise, we're going to go through this policy by policy. I'd like to move that we refer it back to the committee. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I think it's a mistake to refer it back to the committee. We have the opportunity now to discuss these policies, and if a board member, for whatever reason, may not have been able since November 21st to take a look at these policies, which in large part appear in the board handbook, if they haven't had a chance to look at these since November 21st, if they didn't have the opportunity to absorb what was said uh, on December 5th over a month ago, well then perhaps tonight is the opportune time for us to go through the policy. But it'll be whatever the will of the board is. All right, any other discussion? All in favor of the motion to, re uh, to return uh, these policies to the Policy Review Committee uh, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The motion carries. All right, next on our agenda is item J, um, the fiscal 19 county capital budget. And for that, I invite Mr. Saris to come forward. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the chair up or pull yeah, the microphone in for you or whatever. One sorry of the both at all. Um, we have uh, for your consideration tonight the uh, proposed uh, county capital budget request. Uh, at the end of last month, uh, the one item was uh, Colgate Elementary accelerated to the FY19 uh, year and adding approximately $5.1 million to request, uh, now totaling $127 million 
$218,396, and we uh, ask for your approval to move forward. All right, do I have a motion to adopt the FY19 county capital budget request? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to point to the county capital budget at the very bottom of the page under the footnote of item six. The county executive will include $15 million to fund the planning of a new Towson High School and an additional high school subject to the results of the high school study. In, uh, in just a few minutes, we'll be voting on that high school study and it has been, in my opinion, in the opinion of many community members, it has been unnecessarily delayed. We've known about the overcrowding at Towson High School. We've known about the um, dilapidated conditions at Delaney High School for actually a number of years. And yet it is now being left to this study um, to come up with the final solution. Um, what I would like to suggest is that the, um, this county capital budget request be amended, that footnote be amended, that the county executive will include $15 million to fund the planning of a new Towson High School and Delaney High School, subject to the results of the high school study. If for any reason the study indicates that there is a different high school that has projected overcrowding and dilapidated um, uh, facilities to the extent that Delaney High School does, does if the study indicates that there is another high school that has a site with the um, necessary acreage and the, um, the category, categorization of over a four out of five in terms of its site, which provides the ability to put on a replacement school while they're also using the same school, so there's not a need for a swing space. So I would um, ask that we make that amendment and I'll clarify it if, if, um, if asked to do so. Is there a second on that motion? Second. All right, now discussion. Microphone? How can, how can Microphone. Uh, my, my question is how can we uh, suggest or ask the county executive, who will, we will not know who the county executive will be, to, to fund this uh, without first discussing it with the county to see if, if in fact there are funds available or could be available or any kind of financial situation. And so I don't know how we can amend, we, why we should amend its capital, the state budget request uh, with this caveat. Okay, so this is the county capital budget request and everyone will recall that we amended that budget request to add lines 26 and 27 regarding Delaney and Towson and that in fact I believe the county executive added footnote 6 when it came back to us. Uh, so it seemed to me to be uh, improper to uh, tell the county executive uh, what to do and it was the county executive that put in the footnote. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that is correct, and I agree. The county executive does stipulate um, that funding will be available for two high schools, naming Towson as one. This board um, already agreed to name Towson and Delaney as items 26 and 27 on the request. Um, Ms. Causey's motion would make the footnote consistent with those two line items that are added. This does not lock us into um, planning for Delaney. Should the high school study point otherwise, we can always amend it. Um, pending the results of that high school study. For those reasons, I'll be supporting Ms. Causey's motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just uh, remind the board that the purpose of the high school study is to identify high school uh, seat needs throughout the uh, school system. So um, as we're anticipating that there could be needs, for instance, in the southeast area, maybe perhaps in the northeast area as well, I would not want the board to necessarily block itself out um, from planning or funding. So I just wanted to remind the board of the purpose of the high school study. That's Other comments? Oh, I'll, I'll add what, thank you. I'll add with respect to Towson that that conversation regarding 
space and limited availability of seating and so forth um, has been demonstrated over time, which is part of the reason why it's been identified uh, for as long as it has, whereas the discussion regarding the southeast, regarding the northeast, and other areas of our county um, are more in flux, which is why the study has been requested in the first instance and which is why is it, it, it is prudent as well. Okay, you ready to vote on the motion to amend footnote six? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, I, will, I will note you already spoke once to this. Yes, and okay. Robert's Rules of Order does indicate that a, a member can speak twice. I'll be brief. We've had multiple discussions along the way about how Delaney having a replacement school could be a part of the solution for Towson High School, where if Delaney's replacement school is built, then Towson students could move to Delaney, thereby alleviating a great deal of um, problems with construction, thereby increasing the um, decreasing costs because of efficiencies and also um, improving the timeline for when Towson could be completed. So again, I would suggest that we, that we accept my motion so that we can start the planning. If the high school study indicates something other, we have changed capital and county requests along the way over time for changes that come up. So I don't see it as an issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hayden. Mr. Chair, um, one of the things that someone mentioned just a second ago about what the county executive wanted, this is the board's uh, budget and, and the board making a decision based on our knowledge of the school system and the school system's needs. We make the, the, the suggestion through a request to the county executive and then he says whether or not he has the money to fund it. It's, uh, the process doesn't work of us going to the county executive and saying, what would you like us to build? What we're saying is this is what we believe we need. Uh, this is the way it has always happened, or at least it did some years ago. Uh, and the process worked because we would go, the county executive would say, I don't have the money for that. And we would make whatever adjustments were necessary. Or I see your point of view and we're gonna move forward in that direction. And I think it's important for the board to realize that it's our job to make these decisions and not the county executives. Very, very good. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, I recall Dr. Brown appearing uh, before us and commenting about um, the projected growth of our high school students in the eastern part of our county, the northeastern part, our southeastern part. And as I heard our superintendent, this study isn't just about the central quarter where in a different time folks thought everything kind of went to. Um, I've told the story before that, you know, a certain eastern high school was supposed to be renovated. It had worked its way again to the top of the list. It had been funded. And a phone call changed all of that. That school was not renovated. Those dollars went to renovate, of all places, Towson High School. Now, Towson High School most likely needed to be renovated. But I know that Eastern High School, that Kenwood High School, didn't get renovated, has never been renovated. $20 million is being spent there, and folks are very, very appreciative of it. I, I was there. I was there in, in, in December. But as I understand it, this study is about high school needs throughout our county. Why would any of us want to write a study and its outcome before the study itself has been done. It sounds like another argument on a different issue, but for me, I can't see us making a decision without what many folks have said around this dais, the need for data. Why sacrifice the importance of our student needs at the high school level in eastern, northeastern, and southeastern Baltimore County when folks don't even have a study in hand to tell you overall what is important. What if the study reads different than someone's contingency might suggest it could? And they can take that into account. Well, if you can tell me what the winning lottery number was last week, why didn't you just do that? Because we could go ahead and order new schools to be built. We can't. 
This idea to write what the future will be without hard data would be a mistake, and I will oppose this effort. Thanks, Ms. Han. I'll remind you that you also have had a chance to speak, but please speak again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. By accepting this amendment, we're not saying that there are not other needs throughout the county. We know there are needs. But we voted as a board to add lines 26 and 27, naming Towson and Delaney as priorities that we need to address as a board. This footnote is an inconsistency with line items 26 and 27. This amendment fixes that inconsistency. Just to respond very briefly, the fact is, when this was, when these two items were added, I note they were added at the bottom. And at that moment, the addition of those was for planning purposes. And I remember it distinctly being commented by Mr. Smith, who said, the state doesn't fund planning dollars. Now, to hear a member who voted for that effort to now say, oh no, this different chart that reads county capital budget reflects a priority of action taken by this board on a different chart. That is simply not being intellectually honest with future dollars to be spent for our students. In my, in my opinion, I say that of my friend who sits next to me. Mr. Young, did you have a comment? All right. The question, the question is the motion by Ms. Causey, second by Mr. Hayden, to amend footnote six, and instead of saying and an additional high school, to say and Delaney High School. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. That motion fails. Now the motion on the table is to um, uh, adopt the FY19 county capital budget request as presented by Mr. Saris. Further discussion? Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, given the dynamics on our board and discussions we've had over time, I know that this request will be passed, but there are a couple of reasons that I feel compelled to vote against it. First, um, board members have long raised issues about the way in which prioritization of capital projects are made. There's been no improvement in setting priority based on form, uh, foremost on our on system needs. There's no internal running list of projects that changes only when those needs are met. Second, I cannot approve a request for a renovation of Lansdowne High School instead of the necessary replacement school. This request demonstrates fiscal irresponsibility to our taxpayers and ineffectiveness in meeting the needs of the Lansdowne community. If the board continues to approve requests that ignore the needs of our system, the concerns of board members and the input by stakeholders, we will continue to get funding based on incorrect pri priorities. So for those reasons, I will be voting against the request. Any other comments or, uh, before we call the vote? Mr. Hayden. I, I join with the feel that we have to take a stand. The board can't continue to say, well, this is what the county executive wants us to do and we're gonna do it. What do we wanna do for the benefit of children in our school system? What's the right thing to do? And it's in time to do the right thing to do. And to walk away from it continually, as we seem to be doing, is a big mistake for the school system, and it's a big mistake for the future of our schools, and therefore our children. I think that we, as board members, have to step up and say, Mr. County Executive, you have your job and we have ours, uh, and, and I think it's important to take a stand. And, and I am taking my stand tonight and voting no, because I think we can't continue to move forward in directions we don't want to go. Very good. Other questions or comments before we vote? Mrs. Causey. I think Mr. Hayden's comments are absolutely relevant. And while every project down here deserves attention, deserves priority, and deserves funding, as a matter of principle, I'll also be voting no. All right. The question is, uh, uh, on to adopt the FY19 county capital budget request as presented by Mr. Saris. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The motion passes.
All right, next on our agenda is uh, new business personnel matters, and for that, I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I like board consent for the following personnel matters, termination, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, certificated appointments, Area Education Advisory Council appointments, and ed Area Education Advisory Council coordinator. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits K1 through 7? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Point of order, was that fever or favor? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a southern accent favor favor all right that motion carries thank you dr mayo favor uh huh <laughs> and it's still not even late um next on our agenda is item l administrative point uh, administrative appointments ms white Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Coordinator Psychological Services in the Office of School Climate, Supervisor Teacher Development in the Office of Organizational Development, and the MSAP Grant Supervisor in the Office of Educational Options. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit L? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Ms. White is back to you. Thank you. I'd like to present to you, to the board and to the public, Alicia Bennett, who will serve as the new coordinator of psychological services. Will you please stand and... <laughs> Alicia, do you have any friends or family with you here this evening? There you go. Dr. Bennett, congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to present Ann Stuckey, the new supervisor of teacher development in the Office of Organizational Development. Congratulations, Ann. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Congratulations. And uh, Ms. Corinne Roche, she was not able to make it tonight, but she will be the new MSAP grant supervisor in the Office of Educational Options, so congratulations to her as well. Very good. Next on our agenda is item M, uh, to confirm action taken in closed session. And because we didn't have anything, we're not going to have that. <laughs> All right, next is uh, item N, contract awards, and for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Daniels. The uh, board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Um, items N1 through N5 were reviewed, and items N1, N2, N4, N5 are coming to the board with a recommendation from the building and contracts committee. Item three is coming to the full board without a recommendation from the committee. Then let's do uh, a motion consistent with the recommendation of the committee. And first, I have a motion to approve items N1, 2, 4, and 5. Mrs. Causey. Mr. Chair, thank you. There was considerable discussion around um, item one, so if we could do that separately. All right, so now we're going to have a motion on N2, 4, and 5. Is there a motion to accept them? Is there a second? I'm abstaining from number two. Okay. Is there a second to approve contracts N2, 4, and 5? Second. We're okay without a second. Oh, that's, we are okay without a second. Thank God you're here. <laughs> All in fever. No. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? All in favor of N2, 4, and 5, please raise your hands. All right, those three um, are accepted. Now we have N1. Is there a motion to accept, approve N1? 
Okay. <laughs> now, comment. Anyone have any comment before we call the vote? <clears throat> Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had sent in um, in advance as asked. Thank you. I had sent in in advance as asked um, by staff a number of questions, and they, um, because of Mrs. White, uh, are now presenting those in writing, which is very helpful, so thank you for that. Um, however, it was just presented to me um, this afternoon, just ahead of the just ahead of the building and contracts meeting. And um, the reason that I want to take the time with this particular contract is it is for a considerable amount of money, although we have spent more money um, with less discussion. Um, but I think that it warrants complete discussion because it is the learning management system that will touch every student, every teacher, and every uh, parent or guardian or family member that assists a student with their homework or grading or emailing teachers. It also impacts every um, in-school administrator and also uh, impacts a number of our central offices, um, specifically information <coughs> technology and also curriculum and instruction. So in making this very important system decision, I wanted to make sure that we took the time to review um, the information because not all the board members were in the Building and Contracts Committee, um, but also some of the questions did not have an opportunity to be reviewed in the Building and Contracts Committee. Uh, with that being said, we have heard from um, Ms. Baton um, about the need for a more robust system, and we did hear from Building and Contracts a um, uh, during that time, a brief demonstration of the new software, the new learning management software. Um, and we did discuss the costs, which seemed to be um, an improvement for the system, which would make it a, a reasonable system to, to move to. Um, but one that I want that was not really discussed was the uh, plan for implementation, which Ms. Baton brought up, is so vitally critical to our teachers, uh, but also to our students and families. So I wanted to understand more about that initially, and then I had another question. So if you could just go over the, um, the question about what support will be provided and what is the time frame for implementation. Dr. McComas, come on forward. Good evening. Um, Chairman Gillis and members of the board. Um, absolutely, Ms. Causey. We have a very detailed plan of implementation and rollout, um, and pending the board approval could begin tomorrow. Uh, we have um, January through February, we have targeted professional development uh, with curriculum instruction offices to begin moving uh, resources from our current product to this new product. March through April, we will continue to provide targeted support through uh, to our principal principals, um, moving into April and June, support for our uh, school-based resource teachers, department chairs, um, and teacher leadership. Uh, June, we will continue to provide uh, professional development for our, our principals and school-based personnel. Uh, teachers will be provided three hours of paid professional development anchored in their school-based um, environment so that they can have um, direct hands-on support around uh, uh, becoming more familiar. The product will be available uh, beginning a fourth marking period so that we are in compliance with the master agreement. Um, our DOIT department is ready to move and begin uh, working directly with the vendor in terms of technically standing things up. And uh, along with that, the product itself offers um, an embedded online um, program that teachers can self um, look through to help them become more familiar that would be available to them um, full time. I think I'm covering all the pieces. It would go through the um, resource support would be available throughout the summer in various ways. And in August, we would have time before teachers come back to provide, again, uh, time in their buildings and support um, to give them ample time to become familiar with it. Did I answer your question? You answered a large number of them. Uh, the only thing I would have to say is that in looking back over the information that you did provide us on the focus groups that were involved, mm -hmm. um, that there was minimal parent input uh, in the focus groups. 
um, I think it was 40 parents. Um, and out of a school population of 113,000, that's really a drop in the bucket. So one of the issues is what, what is the opportunity for the parents to start using this and then having a feedback loop if there are modifications or tutorials that need to be developed for parents, maybe through our parent university? What, what is going to be the timeline for that? Right. So what we will um, do is work with our school-based personnel to develop, because parents um, are most centered around their particular school, that we can provide opportunities at their school in conjunction with um, support through parent university. So would that be during fourth quarter, or would that be well, back when school is about to start? What we would want to do is work with our principals to schedule that in a way that would work for their communities. Okay. Principals know best uh, what works for their community members. Okay. Thank you. And then the other area of questions that I had, um, there were some answers given, but I, I found them insufficient. Um, in recent months, we've learned of um, areas where we have had administrators and also I've seen personally teachers that have um, a great deal of vendor interaction, some of which has been um, to the extent of some of our staff being paid consulting fees to be on panels with vendors of educational technology, among other things. So it was important to me to ask the question that uh, to understand how purchasing is making sure that our ethic policies are being followed, uh, related specifically to appearances of influence or impropriety, policy 8361, among others. And so I had asked questions about indicating if um, it was known if any of our uh, former employees or current employees with direct or indirect influence on this type of contract have received any gifts over $20 any travel, meal, entertainment, lodging, conference fees, or anything else by the vendor receiving this contract. And I asked a number of questions along that vein, because it's very important to me that with all of the needs that we have in our system, that we are spending every dollar in the most wise and the most efficient fashion. And if there is any hint of undue vendor influence, we can't be sure of that. And, and, and it's vital to me knowing the needs of the system to be able to make the best decisions possible. So the reply, that was given is every effort is made to uphold all Baltimore County Public Schools policies, including but not limited to BCPF ethic policies. Um, however, I'm just curious, how is that done? Because none of those specific questions were answered. I'll take I stand that. by the answers that we've provided. Thank you, George. And I'll, I'll take that because obviously there is a, uh, there are insinuations and there are um, insinuations within the question. And so I just want to thank you, Ms. Causey, for the question because this allows me the opportunity to clear the record. So also, let me just take some time to um, thank our team for bringing forward such a wonderful um, presentation during the Buildings and Contracts Committee about our learning management system. And thank you for engaging so many stakeholders in terms of parents, teachers, administrators, and community members. Uh, our community uh, came to us, and especially in one of our town hall meetings, said to me directly uh, that a change is needed in terms of thinking about teacher workload, making sure that there aren't any additional clicks, then that it's not so cumbersome. And our parents said to me as well that we needed to have an improved uh, system. So thank you to our team, first of all. Uh, let me also just clear the record. It was incorrectly reported before since we are I, I guess like you know putting the um, addressing the elephant in the room um, and just let's just put it on the table when it comes to ERDI ERDI is not a tech-based company and it is a research and development firm every industry has a research and development firm that holds focus groups and the instance so there is an insinuation uh, there and there is a question so the insinuation is that there's something wrong or that there's undue influence because one might be in the room with a vendor or someone may serve as a, on a focus group with a vendor. Because I have served on focus groups does not mean that I've had any undue, undue influence on our contracts. So I think that that insinuation is inappropriate. I think it's misleading. I think it's misguided and it's unnecessary. Our contract um, process is sound. We have, um, we've won, and as I'll talk about in our budget process, won multiple awards for our budget process. And there is no evidence 
evidence to suggest that there has ever been any undue influence on our uh, contract. So I would take exception to that. Now, to answer your question specifically that you addressed, you asked, have I ever served on a p panel with Schoology? And that answer is no. Well, I thank you for your uh, direct answer to that question, because that is helpful. But my questions were not uh, directly related to just you. There were also other staff involved. So my question back to the, our purchasing department is, what processes are used to make sure or to research at all whether there's undue vendor influence? Well, we control the process of issuing the bid documents, um, providing them only to uh, uh, approved vendors who uh, are financially secure and uh, not who have not been debarred by the state of Maryland. Um, we do not, uh, we control the communications up until the bid doc, uh, the proposals are received, the proposals are kept separate from the pricing. In this case where you have an RFP, the pricing is sealed, the proposals are then evaluated without any of the evaluators knowing what the price is, and then um, the interviews are conducted, they're objectively, they're scored by a group of panelists who represent the end user as well as other offices as well as the office of purchasing to make sure that the, there's nobody else in the room that the process is is supervised by the office of purchasing as the objective uh, manager of the process and um, it's completely impossible for us to have answered a question about board members or any staff or any member of the vendor staff. We have no way of being able to go back five years and answer this question factually for you. So we rely on the process that we've described and the process has been audited. The process has been evaluated by independent uh, professional groups, and uh, the process is continually improved. So I don't believe that there's anything that uh, I or my office have done that's inappropriate. Thank you, and I'm not insinuating that you all have done anything inappropriate. What I am asking is what are the processes that we have in place to make sure that there has not been undue vendor influence? And it seems in this case that that, in terms of using the focus groups and using the evaluations, in fact, having the RFP go out and so forth, helps in uh, confidence in the process. Um, I had also asked a question about is this vendor an ARD client, and did, um, and the answer given was BCPS does not maintain a list of ERDI clients. Well, it's Why would I know what who ERDI does business with? Um, well, they have a website, and on it they have a list of who their clients are. And ERDI's clients being companies that are trying to sell products and services to school systems, those ERDI clients pay ERDI. And then ERDI pays superintendents or other high-level school uh, officials to be on panels. So there is a connection, and it's not, um, it's not that blurry to see. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just have to, again, uh, take exception to the notion that because one sits on a focus group with ERDI does not mean that there has been any undue influence on any contract. Again, the focus groups are for the purposes of research and development. Again, for products and services that are not even yet ripe for sales. There are no sales pitches um, at, uh, during that work. It is the whole purpose is to make sure that educators have a voice 
when it comes to the products and services that are in development for children. And who know children better than educators? And so they ask educators to come in and consult on products and services that are in development. So again, this, you're, that is a stretch to say that then there is, um, there is a line that is drawn between those products and services that are in development and then there's their contract. Again, there are insinuations in that question that I think are misleading to the public, that I think that are inappropriate, and I'd like to give all assurances to the public that, that nothing inappropriate has been done. Anyone who knows my reputation and knows who I am knows that my integrity is not for sale. And so again, I would like just to clear the record and to just say for the record that we operate with the highest levels of integrity. We hire, uh, we operate under all BCPS policies and rules. We don't make any apologies for the way that we operate because we do so ethically. And so that's what I'd like to say for that. Are the there any other questions about the learning management software system known as Schoology? Excuse me, I was interrupted. I wasn't you finished You weren't my interrupted. Time. She was just speaking. And now I spoke. Excuse me. Do you me, have Ms. additional questions, Ms. Causey? I do. Okay, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, so it, just to let you know, uh, Schoology is an ARD client, but that does not, that's a fact, and I'll leave it at that. So it's fair to say that purchasing does not do research for issues of possible undue vendor influence, and that is as it is. I disagree with that. I also disagree Your with Your question. That. Okay. I actually have a question from Ms. Causey. Mr. Stewart. Very quickly, which is that are, are we as a system prohibited from doing business with any customer, sponsor, client, or anybody who gives money to an ERDI or ERDI-like networking uh, community? No, we're not. But okay. I think we need to go That's, into... Um, just a yes or no. I'm trying to understand Thank your you. position. Thank and you. My, and my final point is, while this system does seem very appropriate and effective, for our school system based on the information that we received in building and contracts, based on the information that Ms. White gave us in our weekly update, which again is uh, improvement over former um, information dissemination that it was given quickly. I don't, um, but the point is, is that we can't act as if there's no need to look at the issue. That's not what I've heard tonight. Okay, so well, when we, I, when we ha when I have an information request that has gone unanswered that was uh, given, I believe, in the November 21 timeframe to the board chair and the superintendent related around specific questions, then I have concerns. And if other people want to act as if they don't have concerns around this issue, that's certainly up to them. I am just saying that when I submit questions and the answers are insufficient, then I want to know more. The last part of my comments is this, this particular purchase is through the RFP process and we've received a lot of information about it. But there are other purchases that have not. We had the, no, and this was a question I submitted in advance that was not answered about the projector systems that were voted against, excuse me, voted so, against so this in is, February this is of 2016. A this is a discussion about the learning management software system known as Schoology, not about projectors, Ms. Causey. Are there any more questions about Schoology? There are Miller. Uh, thank you, and I and I want to thank Ms. Causey for raising these issues because I did note that this was an early client as well. Um, this is a fairly large contract in excess of three million dollars, and it is unfortunate that um, circumstances cause some board members to question when we're doing business with early. Uh, already clients. Um, I, I think that uh, until such time that um, the public has been assured of our processes and um, our purchasing practices, uh, there will be questions like this. And there, there isn't anything wrong with asking the questions. Um, I, I think that the uh, a comprehensive audit would go a long way in helping this. So um, I, I thank Ms. Causey for the questions. Are there any other questions or comments before we call the vote on N1, which is the Schoology contract? All right, 
All in favor of N1, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion passes. The last contract is N3. N3 is an evaluation of high school capacity and enrollment. Um, is there a motion to accept N3? So moved. All right, discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In Building and Contracts Committee, we had um, some good discussion about this high school capacity and enrollment study. It was um, questioned about the time frame because the deliverables that we are expecting from it, that we, um, that staff has told us the deliverable um, schedule would culminate in September 2018, uh, coming before the board. Uh, so it was questioned why the term was one year and five months. It was also questioned as to the, um, the total cost of the contract or the spending authority with the system asking for $200,000. Um, when discussed, it became clear that the actual um, consulting fees that are that SAGE Policy Group is expecting to do this work is uh, in the neighborhood of $120,000. Is that correct, um, Mr. Saris? 124000 just under 125000 So one, I would like to um, make a motion to amend the term to, to have it meet with our deliverables which is 10 months. Actually, it's nine months. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is that- Well, let's have, let's have a, a, a vote on, on that. Is there a second to Ms. Causey's motion to amend the term of this contract? Second. Okay, discussion. I would agree to having an extension on it, if that's necessary, um, but perhaps one year rather than, than two. I just don't un understand the, the reasoning Mr. behind Mr. Young. That. What is the rationale for the term of one year, five months on this initial contract? Just to allow for any additional issues that come up in the course of study that uh, might be of further interest to the board. May I ask a question? Um, and that is, what is the, what was the, um, the request that SAGE Policy Group responded to in terms of the timeline? The deliverables for through for September of 18 was the primary timetable. There you go. Okay. I'd just like to add a few things to it. Uh, having a lot of experience in these type of contracts, it is not unusual to have things, projects, items that have to be added to meet the requirements of the final study. It is not unusual to have additional cost to it. If you look at the completion time, it's September. If we miss one board meeting for any additional approval, we'll miss our final timeline. So you can reduce the term of the contract, you can reduce the cost, knowing that there's a good possibility there'll be additional work that either you'll be asking or will be requesting the consultant that won't be able to be completed in time. So I just wanted to share with the board that thing. All right, further discussion, Mrs. Hen. If that's the case and additional work would be required, there, what would be at risk by having a gap period and bringing that back to the board for approval? As I explained to you, the completion time is September. Board meetings happens once every, uh, you know, twice every month, mm -hmm. and it takes some time to prepare information to bring it to board, so we may lose a month to six weeks for doing additional work. What that means is that we'll miss the critical timeline of September, which is what for inclusion in our capital program. So there are timelines involved here. Uh, Dr. Brown's staff and we have thought very carefully about it. So if we change this and if any additional work is required or additional dollars are required, we want board to understand that a study will not be complete before submission of the capital program. Any, any other questions or comments before we vote on the motion to amend? Mr. Uhlfelder. Uh, my comment is that uh, the um, bidder in this case uh, bid with, with, with the proposal, and if you change the time thing, the, uh, the cost may also change. 
and uh, only the bidder knows whether that may or may not happen, so be very careful. Ben. And I believe what's in question here are, is not the cost, but rather the time frame and understanding what the scope is, yeah. given that the deliverables are while, due while in September. While we have tried to define the scope of work, it is not unusual to have items during the stu study that need additional information. That means expanding the scope of work. And that, that would adjust means the adding price. time. That means adding price. And that's why you see some allowance for time and some allowance for dollars. Any other so questions or comments? So as we understand all sides of it, yes, we can reduce the dollar, we can reduce the time, but should there be a change in scope, we'll miss the capital deadline. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Now with the extensions, would they have to come back to the board for approval before the extension? If the can, extensions can go place? beyond the dollar amount that board is approving, which is 200, we'll come to board. But if it is between 125 and 200,000, we have that superintendent has that flexibility to authorize the additional work. So if the term was, say, a year, we would know at nine months that we weren't going to hit our deliverable because that's when we've, we're projecting. Yeah. Um, there would then be built in time to approve an extension. I'm not sure if I understand your question, but our final information has to be made available by September to be included in the capital program. Mm -hmm. um, the way is this is months. presented is that we would not come back to Turn the board off. to exercise this extension. Power it off. We would only come back to the board uh, previ previously if we had exceeded the, or if we were about to exceed this $200,000 amount. So if the term were one year, we've already missed then our target by three months. And there could be a, a slight extension of a, a three month extension or something like that. That would give them an, a, a six month cushion there, yeah. six months past our target. Yeah. And we'd already know three months in advance that we weren't hitting our target. So that would take care of, you know, the timeline that you were nervous there, about. There are questions that are asked by a state also at times, even after completion of study. If we complete, if we submit a project in the capital program, there may be additional questions. We don't know. So this will give us the flexibility. Superintendent will have the flexibility of making sure that all of the questions before by the board, by the staff, and after by IAC can be incorporated in that contract. All right. The motion, the motion is to reduce the contract term from one year, five months to one year, correct? Actually, it was to 10 months. To 10 months. From one year, five months to 10 months. Any other questions or comments about is that? Is there a definition on the extension? It would remain. The As year extension by that they don't have to come back to us on. All right. all right. All in favor of the all in favor of the motion to reduce the contract term from one year five months to ten months, please raise your hand. All right. That motion fails for lack of uh, sufficient votes. Now, the motion that's on the table is to approve contract N three, which is the. Uh, evaluation of high school capacity and enrollment. Any other discussion on that, Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had also wanted to incorporate adding to the scope. Um, one of the things that we've recognized as we've gone through several redistrictings, as we've gone through several analyses of um, trying to deal with overcrowding, both overcrowding that is with us right now, but overcrowding that may happen in the future, also in trying to decide where to add seats. Um, it's become clear that it should be better planned around the middle schools. So I would ask, as um, one of our stakeholders has already asked us to do, and I won't go for efficiencies, I won't review all of the reasons why it would make sense, but I think it's intuitive that if we're going to spend this money with this uh, consulting group to do this study, that it should be around the middle schools as well, so that we don't have students that may be transitioning in elementary school to a different middle school, then back to a different high school, and that we can use our construction dollars more efficiently um, around the middle schools and the high schools, because 
there's um, several middle schools uh, that are in play in this capital construction, um, including Golden Ring Middle School, including Pine Grove Middle School, including Perry Hall Middle School, um, where it's unclear what relief Perry Hall Middle School is going to get out of Northeast Area Middle School because of the Golden Ring Middle School. Let's see if we get a second to that over. motion first before you um, argue in favor of it anymore. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All right. Now, is there additional comment you want to make? If other people would like to comment. All right. So if if you uh, if uh, if this contract was to expand from a high school study to a high school and a middle middle school study, would that require it to go back out to bid? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Well, that's a question for Mr. Saris. Yes. 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 All right. Yes, okay. I, I believe so that they would any other Any other question or comment? Which also means that we may not be able to meet the September deadline. Very good. Any other questions or comments about the motion to amend to include middle school? I would just like to point out that just recently the RFP for the procurement audit, it was amended and the <clears throat> bid date was not changed. Um, so I think that if we moved forward with this contract, but if we would make a motion to direct the superintendent and the uh, Office of Purchasing to come to discussions with Sage Policy Group as to would they be able to incorporate an additional study um, and still meet our timeline for our high school requirements. All right, so the motion, the motion on the table. Oh, other additional comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one note, and that is going back a ways, when we first discussed the study, the original scope was a secondary study and secondary enrollment study. Okay. It did include middle and high schools, and this board did approve that All right, any other, as the scope. Any other questions or comments? The motion is to expand the scope of the contract from high school to both high school and middle school. All in favor of that expanded motion, please, expanded scope, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, it fails. Now, the motion on the table is uh, contract N3, uh, evaluation of high school capacity and enrollment. Any further discussion on it? All right. It's time for the question on N3. All in favor, please raise your hands. Mr. Yulefelder abstains. The motion passes. Thank you all. Next on the agenda is item O, which is a report on achievement update on PARCC Park. Dr. Brown. So I'm going to make a brief cameo here. Um, good evening, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, uh, Superintendent White, members of the board and community. Um, Back in August of 2017, uh, our colleagues from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Ross and Dr. Morrison, uh, presented the third year update on, on the STAT program and the rollout of the STAT program. At that point in time, they had data uh, from our MAP assessments, but the park data had just been released and had not been made available to them in time for that presentation. During the August meeting, uh, board members requested that, that uh, Johns Hopkins take the time to evaluate the park data and come back and present to you uh, the results of the park data. I'm pleased that Dr. Morrison has made, made that time available, has a, uh, made an extra appearance for us uh, to deliver that information. And with uh, no further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Morrison to present the park information. Thank you. Oh, we need a clicker. Just wait for the slides. <laughs> Don't have a slide. Some 
four dogs. <laughs> She's gonna be deaf. <laughs> Dr. Morrison, you're losing your audience. I know. <laughs> Perfect time for a quick break. There we go. Okay. All right, um, thank you for uh, having me here to present on the Park Student Achievement Analyses. Um, so if you wanna click the next slide. So displayed um, on your screen is the evaluation model, including time frames for when one might expect to see results. So this is the evaluation model that we present each time. Um, so the effect on goals, including student achievement, we anticipated to have evident in years three to four and beyond. So we're responding to the board's request to examine the most recent student achievement results reflected in PARC data. Next slide. And I just wanted to provide a reminder of when our cohort started. So cohort one, Lighthouse grades one through three began in 2014. Now be in their third year of SAD implementation, or well, they finished their third year of SAD implementation. And then Lighthouse grades K four and five started in 2015-16, so they are in. They finished their second year. Um, we went ahead and included Lighthouse grades four and five results in our present report, even though we wouldn't yet expect to see an impact of STAT on student achievement within these grades. Okay, next. So in addition to obtaining Baltimore County data, we obtained some comparison districts data, um, as well as the state of Maryland performance on the park assessments. And I think it's important to illustrate that there isn't a wonderful ideal comparison district for Baltimore County. So we went with some that were good matches in some demographic areas, but maybe not so great matches in other areas. So Anne Arundel County and Montgomery County have a lower proportion of African American students as compared to Baltimore County. And they also have a lower proportion of farms eligible students. Then Prince George's County has a higher proportion of African American students, and then a higher proportion of farms eligible students. In terms of Baltimore County's comparison with the state, um, BCPS has a slightly lower proportion of, or um, the state has a slightly lower proportion of African American students and farms eligible students, but the state is probably the best comparison in terms of just demographics. Next slide. So what is in the report and then what I'll discuss in a little bit more detail is that the schools under study in the Lighthouse um, grade three began either year one or the pre-program year, referring to grades four and five, below the state in both subjects. So the proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations. By 2016-17, which was this past year, all three have either substantially closed the gap with the state or exceeded the state in the proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations. So what's displayed on your screen here is the change in proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations. So we looked at for grade three, that would be year one, 2014-15, and then grades four and five would be um, their pre-program year through the most recent year of student achievement data. And then what you can see is for uh, mathematics achievement, the Lighthouse schools, grades three, four, and five are all exceeding the change in proportion of students meeting expectations. So that growth is much more substantial over time as compared with our state and with the comparison districts. So grade three began below the state in the proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations at the end of year one, and then surpassed the state during year two, then ended year three slightly above the state. For grade four, they were below the state at the end of the pre-program year, then comparable with the state at the end of year one and year two. And then for grade five, they were below the state at the end of the pre-program year and comparable with the state at the end of year one and year two. 
Just as with mathematics, um, BCPS Lighthouse schools, grades three, four, and five are exceeding the proportion of students, or the change in proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations as compared with the state and the comparison districts. So grade three began below the state at the end of year one and then surpassed the state during year two, then ended year three comparable with the state. Grade four was below the state at the end of the pre-program year and then comparable with the state at the end of year one and year two. And grade five was below the state at the end of the pre-program year and then comparable with the state at the end of year one and year two. So our findings presented in the addendum are consistent with the temporal logic model for the SAT evaluation. We expected to see an impact on student achievement in year three and beyond. Indeed, PARC data results reflected for Lighthouse grade three, now in their third year of implementation, indicated that students outperformed comparison districts and the state in terms of cumulative growth, both in mathematics and ELA. The proportion of students at least meeting expectations increased from year one to year three in both subject areas, and this proportion increased across years to a greater extent than comparison districts and the state. We did not yet expect to see an impact on Lighthouse grades four and five as they're in their second year of SAT implementation, but as with grade three, the proportion of students at least meeting expectations has increased across years at a greater rate than both the comparison districts and the state. So we would anticipate more noticeable improvements within Lights, Lighthouse grades four and five after their third year of stat implementation. And any questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions or comments from board members? Thank you. Um, just a question about um, park test results between various jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. When uh, there's a comparison between Baltimore County and another district, is that other district taking exactly the same park test? Um, because we understand that whether they're taking it on paper or, or by computer, it could be some differences introduced. The whole, is all the state online now? The, the state is moving. Yep. <coughs> So it's the same assessment, I believe, all online. Oh, okay. Well, we do know that some jurisdictions are not online, but I didn't. I don't know about these specific ones. Um, I don't know about those specific ones. I would gather that Montgomery County is online, for okay. sure. But I can look into the other two and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, it references the logic model, and it says it's in the main report as figure one. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which I, I'm not seeing a figure one. Is that the very first page where it shows the four different colored boxes? Yes. Is that the logic yes. model? Okay. Um, these other um, counties that were being compared to... Um, can you describe what their status is as far as devices, device use? I'm not entirely certain what each of their device, like if they're one-to-one -one or anything like that. Um, I know like we're participating in evaluation of the curriculum at Montgomery County, and I believe that they're more digital. I'm not entirely certain about the other ones. Because it would seem to me that you would pick comparison counties maybe that aren't you know, so that we can see, okay, what is the, what is the effect of the devices and the, and the STAT program, the technology initiative, you know, well, compared ideally, to other counties sure, that are not. Sure, totally understand. Ideally, you want to compare based on demographics and those kinds of characteristics that you can't control. So that's why we looked at um, the farms and the ethnicity distribution, things like that. Um, in the real world, technology shouldn't have an effect. It's the quality of the instruction. It's what you're doing with the devices, which is what STAT is all about. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the data for these comparisons, was that provided to you by BCPS? Was that state data? It's available through the Maryland report card online. Okay. And have our, uh, have our BCPS staff then reviewed that data as well and, and verified your findings here? Have you reviewed the data and verified our findings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yes, yeah. okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to dovetail with Mr. McDaniels, um, I believe what you were asking about is the mode effect, mm -hmm. where uh, there are differences seen in students that were taking the tests, especially in the initial um, application of the test in the state of Maryland, um, where those that were those students that were taking the tests on paper performed better, even though every other um, variable was removed. Um, has anyone ever determined the reason for the mode effect? Um, we have not studied that directly, I believe informally. Um, it sounds like from what we have heard from um, users and teachers at schools and everything, it sounds like there's, there was an issue with the interface. It was like a usability issue if you're dealing with technology. So boxes were too small, it's like a functional. It wasn't, there shouldn't be a difference between a paper test and a computer test, ideally. But if the interface is, um, malfunctioning and things like that, then there would, that would be the issue. Okay, so there's not, there wasn't a clarification by MSDE or by Park itself uh, or Pearson as to the concrete reasons for the mode effect. M Ms. Kazi, I, I was on, not to interrupt you, I was under the impression it was an entirely different test. There were actual videos that you were asked about online, but that couldn't be displayed on a piece of paper. So there were actual differences in the test. Is that correct? There are actual differences in the test? I am, uh, that's outside of our scope, so I'm not sure. Okay. She's heading, she's shaking her head yes, that there were differences between the paper and the? I took the park test my sophomore year and I took it online and we listened to audio messages and we watched a video. Yes, hi. I, I believe, Mr. Ch Mr. Sorry, should we tell him on the mic, right? I believe um, we talked about this at curriculum committee. What we know and understand is that it is not that students who took the paper test outperformed those who didn't. It is that the paper test could not match the intended level of rigor as the online assessment because of the, excuse me, the different features and things you can do online, like video, um, multimedia, drag and drop can't be reproduced on paper. <clears throat> Hustled up here now, I can't breathe, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I also had another um, question. Um, so I was sent information from a stakeholder with a series of um, well-articulated charts related to our lighthouse schools, because in the materials that um, are included with you and then other materials that we've received from our staff, there's um, been comparisons with the lighthouse average. Um, and what these charts indicate, and I emailed it to um, Ms. White and uh, our fellow board members, and um, I'm, I have also put a printout at all of the board members' desks. And I labeled it draft um, until um, Ms. White can have appropriate staff confirm or correct. Um, but um, in my review, it, it does seem to be accurate. And what I find um, unhelpful is that the Lighthouse average contains 10 schools and there was one new school that was built, so it was a brand new school that was built that was included as a Lighthouse school, and that's Mays Chapel Elementary School. But the other 10, uh, the other nine schools, that comprise the 10 Lighthouse Elementary Schools, Hawthorne, Halstead, Lansdowne, Edmonton Heights, Fort Garrison, Chase, Church Lane, Java View, and Rogers Forge, they had uh, very disparate performance levels, historical performance levels. Um, and then when one looks at the chart that's related to, um, and actually, would you pass that down if she wants to take a look at it? Um, there's a chart that relates to the performances in 2014, the spring of 2014 with math broken out and then third grade reading broken out. And then in meeting the park in 2017. And what this shows is that there is still quite a disparate performance level between these schools and it remains consistent with their historic performance. So it seems that by having an average in these reports, that it's, it's, a, it's not really um, 
you know, a valid reflection because it seems from these charts, and again, I've asked the superintendent to have them confirmed uh, or corrected, um, there's a vast, a vast difference in performance from some schools, for instance, Rogers Forge getting 70 percent um, meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA, and some of our other schools, um, you know, doing 40 percent or even 15 percent meeting or exceeding. So my question is, is how are we really to understand how we are closing the achievement gaps and raising rigor when these 10 lighthouse schools have consistent disparate performances? So uh, first response is that pretty much with every evaluation, you're going to have a normal distribution. So if everyone can visualize the normal curve, bell-shaped curve, you're going to have outliers. You're not going to have everyone exactly in the center at the mean. So there's going to be variation, variability. Second of all, we did look at, so that's why we report on the aggregate. Um, and then I think in every single published research study, unless it's a case study and more qualitative, you are going to see an average reported, along with mean standard deviation. Um, in addition, we looked at school by school performance just to be able to respond to this sort of question. What I can tell you is that in ELA, eight out of 10 schools had at least two grades exceed the state in the change in proficiency across years. For mathematics, seven out of 10 schools had at least two grades. When you say two grades, what, what do you mean so by that? So if we look at grade three, four, and five, two of those three in eight out of 10 for ELA and seven out of 10 for math have exceeded the state change in the proportion of students meeting or exceeding expectations? It, it just seems that there's still an insignificant level of improvement for the vast expenses. I, and with the fact that I would that say the, eight out of 10 is really quite positive. Seven out of 10, I that's just me. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to my board members to look at these results because it does not seem as if we are really improving uh, or, or, you know, closing the achievement gap at the elementary schools. I know that we have had success in the graduation rates, which has been commendable to all of the um, teachers and students and administrators that have been working on that. But from what I'm seeing, the use of averages and when we're talking about the, the increase being quite small even with the averages, it, it's just concerning with the with the amount of investment. Mm -mm. This I'm, I'm seeing double digit changes in proficiency in certain grades in certain schools. In MAP or in Park? Park. And which schools are those? Um, let's see. So Church Lane ELA grade three, proficiency change was 31.41 points from pre-program to the most recent year. That's double digit. Fort Garrison Elementary's third grade ELA performance. Um, Rogers Forge, third grade ELA performance. I mean, I could go on. I have it all laid out. And is that in here? Because I didn't see that in No, here. like I said, we, we typically don't want to report on individual school performance. We look at the aggregate because we're going to have the normal curve. You're going to have some very high performers. You're going to have some stragglers. I think it's important for the district internally to look at those schools that maybe aren't performing quite to the level of expectation and see what can be done. But overall, on the aggregate, there's positive change happening. Okay, I guess from my perspective, I don't like things being in averages when we have such a disparate because what we wanna do is we wanna try and bring every student up and make sure that we're doing the best by every student and when we're lumping all these things together in averages, it's not showing us that clear picture. Um, and I remember discussing this a couple of years ago. Within our own, I, I remember discussing this a few years ago. Within our own Lighthouse schools, we discussed the fact that certain schools, and again, I should, I should believe that you would want to take the farm population and the eth ethnicity of the schools because they do have a direct effect. But for example, we had a discussion, I remember, with uh, one of our former board members that a school such as Fort Garrison, these kids came into the STAT program way ahead of the game. They all, I'll tell, I'll tell you right now, they all had computers already, they all knew what they were doing. But if you went into one of the schools that had a high farm population, those kids didn't have the advantage of having home computers and everything else. So you would expect that school, if you compare it to another one, uh, to be way ahead of the game. But the, the increase in the school itself is very meaningful. 
So it's very difficult to, to if, if you want an assessment, to, to sit there and go school by school, you take an aggregate. But I can tell you that there's other factors that make the difference in certain schools, and that's the school population and, um, and you know, their, their uh, economics and where they come from and their households and the computers that they have in their households. And, you know, they came into the program, I know, forecast, and they most of them had computers before we even started the program, so I would suspect that they would have a high degree of proficiency. Very good. Dr. Morrison, thanks very much for, this. for your presentation. Dr. Brown, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate the update on the park. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, item P, uh, the report on the proposed fiscal year 2019 operating budget. And I invite Ms. White to change seats. <laughs> All right. May I stay in my seat, You may Mr. stay wherever Chair. you want. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening again to Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, members of the board. And before I get started, again, we know that um, there are times tonight that have gotten really intense really fast, and I just would like just to kind of have everybody just take a deep breath for a moment because I am excited about this operating budget. Um, this is a time, people ask me all the time, you know, what are you excited about when it comes to being interim superintendent? And it's times like this, when I get a chance to speak for the public, when I get a chance to speak for our teachers, our advisory groups, our administrators, when we have an opportunity to put all of those comments together and develop a budget that really speaks to the needs of our system. I get really excited about that. So I'm just, um, I'd like to present to you our FY19 operating budget. And again, let's take some of the intensity out and just really focus on some of the good things. I'd like to tell uh, the BCPS story. So uh, oftentimes I'll talk about how our every child has a story. Well, our school system has a dynamic story to tell too. So tonight Tonight, I'd like to go through kind of the what, why, and how of the budget, but I'd like to do that by illustrating our BCPS story. So if you'll bear with me, and again, I, I know that I'm a little excited about the budget. That's because I believe that we have a really good proposal um, to present, and so I'd like to share it with you tonight. First, I'd like to start, though, with some thank yous. And I, I started by talking about this being a collaborative um, process. As you know, it is a collaborative process. It is one that in involves not only our budget office, but so many of our parents, our community members, our stakeholders, our teachers, our teachers association, as well as many of you. I've met with each and every board member individually. Thank you for your uh, time between uh, July 1st and now to hear what the system uh, looks like or to see the system through your lens and to try to get an understanding of what your priorities are as board members. So thank you for your time. Thank you for all of the teachers, um, time and administrators for the over 65 schools that I've had an opportunity to visit uh, this fall as well as the uh, town hall meetings that we've had to hear directly from the community as well as to work with many of our elected officials, our county partners and especially our our budget office and again I know that we normally save some of these thank yous to the end but I'm not quite sure if everyone realizes the time the contribution of time effort and energy that goes into the development of the budget so if you would just please join me in a moment especially to thank Kevin Smith George Saris Whit Tantliff and the, the budget team thank you for helping me put this together The proposed FY19 budget focuses on growth in four core areas. Um, those areas are special education and our English learner populations, system-wide growth and infrastructure, literacy, and school climate. The bottom line of this presentation is that although we must continue to provide essential resources for effective teaching and learning, we also need people for our people. 
we are in a people business. And that is not to speak against any industry where there's a lot of paper involved. But in our industry, in our profession, we work directly with kids, directly with students. I know how to do a, some things that, well, I don't know how to do a whole lot of things, but I do know how to teach reading. And I'm not sure how to do that exclusively without sitting beside a child and being able to walk that child through that reading process. So again, the business that we're in, we're in the business of people. So the bottom line of this budget is that it is a people budget, people focused budget. While overall instructional resources have increased to support the aggregate enrollment growth over the past several years, BCPS must invest in additional resources to provide for the academic progress of students with disabilities and our English learners. So they are some of our most vulnerable populations. Five-year growth rates for students identified with disabilities include students who have been diagnosed with autism. Students who have been diagnosed with autism, they were up about almost 25 percent. Students who have been diagnosed with developmental delays were up nearly 41 percent. With those diagnosed with multiple disabilities, we're up nearly 32 percent, which has increased much faster than overall enrollment growth. The number of English learners grew 132.3 percent over 10 years in FY18 through FY18. The proposed FY19 budget improves student to teacher ratios and instructional caseloads across the system for both special education and English learner students. BCPS's expanding infrastructure requires additional resources to keep up with the pace of enrollment growth. BCPS has addressed some of these needs in the past in past years and will continue to do so in the proposed FY19 budget. Additionally, reading and writing in school every day is critical for student achievement in all subject areas. We must teach students how to read, write, and think like professionals in every field. Mastering literacy positions our students for success in both their academic careers and later in life. A positive school climate helps students achieve and grow. Highly effective daily instruction improves student behavior by meeting students' individual needs. The next slide will show you our student, our service support model. The service support model is used to address the needs of all schools, offices, and stakeholders by providing effective and efficient services. As always, if you take a look at that support model, you'll see principals and schools at the center of the model because they are the, our most important stakeholders. Our schools are the most important um, our constituent that we have. So we need to make sure that all roads lead back to effective daily instruction. When it comes to our um, changing environment, we know that our students face a rapidly changing environment. In order to be college and career ready, our students need to graduate not only with a diploma, but also with a resume. Many times, you and many folks have heard me say before that we are proud of our graduation rate, and we are. A lot of hard work has gone into that. But we also need to know, as my mother would say, that graduation is our reasonable service, and that we're supposed to graduate students and make sure that we're shaking their hands and that they graduate with a diploma. But the question to be asked is, what else can we provide? And so many of you have heard me refer to this as our gift with purchase, so that when students cross the stage and we shake their hands and we talk about globally competitive graduates, what else might they have so that they are truly competitive when they're competing with their peers for the same jobs and competing with their peers for that entrance into, into colleges, what else might they offer? So I suggest to you that we should offer them an opportunity to have additional college credits when they walk across the stage. Perhaps they'll have industry credentials. Perhaps they will be proficient in a second language. Perhaps they will have a specialty in, the, in music or in the arts. We need to make sure that they have that something extra because we know know that the economy and the industries that they're entering to will demand it. We need to know that we need to keep in mind that the skills required to do the jobs well are expected to change in just a few years. When our first graders come of age, 
65% of them will work in completely new job types that do not currently exist. So keep in mind this, just take in, into uh, consideration some of the jobs that are in high demand right now. Jobs such as um, app developers or driverless car engineers. When our current seniors were kindergartners, those jobs didn't exist. So again, we need to prepare them for their future, not for ours. We need, they need to take care of us, <laughs> but they, they need to make sure that we're preparing them for their future. That means that we're also moving students beyond just those core knowledge skills. It's also about reading and writing and thinking, computing and behaving in socially acceptable ways. It's about students learning those soft skills like grit and determination, how to move the project through from beginning to the end, making sure that students know how to have a successful interview, making sure that students understand how to collaborate with others, how to cooperate with others, how to use technology and media, and how to use their resources effectively. That's what we need to require, and we need to support our students for every single one of our students whom we serve. So when it comes to developing the budget, we also must consider some of our fiscal challenges that are at hand. As was said earlier, pov poverty in Baltimore County is much more prevalent than just a decade ago. While the number of students requiring intensive resources is escalating rapidly, we must also take into account our, um, the, our fiscal environment that is likely to remain challenging. So our needs are many, but we must, uh, what we need to do most effectively is to allocate those resources that we do have available to us. So I've outlined what the budget priorities are as well as what our service model looks like and what our students can expect upon graduation and in their future. I'd also like to share what we know about that which is working well in our system. As our successes are an important part of our BCPS story. Many times our successes um, are sometimes overlooked. Sometimes when our successes are noted as successes, they're met with skepticism. So I'd like to make sure that we are highlighting our successes because they are a part, a real part, of our BCPS story. So having said that, let's begin with the academics. Um, while our students have increasing needs, BCPS is showing strong improvements in many areas, many of which you've just heard about in terms of the Johns Hopkins evaluation. In grades one through three, there have been steady improvements in achievement as measured by MAP in both reading and mathematics. Students in grades three through five, as you've just heard in our Lighthouse schools, outperformed comparable groups across the state as measured by PARC. So while the BCPS graduation rate continues to increase, college matriculation rates have remained stable and more students are enrolling in their second year of college. So it's not just a matter of getting students into college. It's about, again, that grit and perseverance and the fact that those matricul matriculation rates have remained stable, that's good news, not only for our students, but most importantly, for those graduates. So again, that's good news for our system. We also celebrate 89.17% overall graduation rate for the class of 2016, which, which has climbed for the past six years. The BCPS graduation rate exceeds the Maryland state average of 87.6%. When it comes to CTE, CTE is delivering improved career readiness and job placement, and anyone who knows me knows that I am a huge advocate and proponent of CTE. More students are meeting industry certification standards and dual completion standards, as you can see here on the slide. 83.8% of CTE completers entered post-secondary education employ employment or the military within two quarters following graduation. And I would challenge anyone who believes that CTE is, CTE is any less rigorous than our college pathway. We know that many of our CTE completers go on, they receive multiple scholarships, and they go on to lead very prosperous uh, lives and are absolute, 
absolutely employable. And so I just take my hat off to all of our CTE completers as well. When it comes to the SAT, SAT achievement increased in evidence-based reading and writing and mathematics overall and for all subgroups of students. 87.9% SAT participation in 2017 was due to SAT school day. So when we talk about access and um, access, it's not just accessing resources, but it's access of opportunities, making sure that all of our students have the opportunity. I remember when we went to an SAT day, and many of uh, the critics at that time said, oh no, your SAT scores are going to drop significantly because you have more students who are taking the test. We said as a system that it's important for our students to have the opportunity to take the SAT and we offer that opportunity to all of our, our, to all of our youngsters and as we can see the results are absolutely paying off. When it also comes to our successes, BCPS now has 24 Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools. We have 20 National Blue Ribbon Schools. 13 BCPS high schools ranked among the nation's best, according to U.S. News and World Report and the Washington Post. We have been recognized as the National School Library Program of the Year and the NAM Instrumental Music Program Award for the 12th consecutive year. I'd also like to highlight that the BCPS has received the Trusted Learning Environment Seal. We have received the Digital Content and Curriculum Achievement Award for the second time. We've received the Fuel Education Transformation Award for our Passport Program, and we've received the Common Sense Certified District um, Award for Digital Citizenship. Now, again, we've had some discussion tonight about our uh, procurement and finances, so let's talk about that a little bit. Our financial awards uh, must be noted as well. For the 21st consecutive year, BCPS was awarded a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Association of School Business Officials. The Controller's Office received for the 21st consecutive year the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government, Government Finance Officers Association. ASBO awarded its meritorious, more, more meritorious budget award to BCPS for excellence in preparation of its school system budget for the 14th consecutive year. For the 13th consecutive year, Baltimore County Public Schools has earned the prestigious Annual Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award from the National Procurement Institute, Incorporated. For the 13th consecutive year, the Office of Budget and Reporting received the GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for its annual budget presentation. And again, to our budget office, I say congratulations. This portion of our BCPS story highlights who we are and gives us a picture of the students we serve. The needs of our students are increasing. You can see here that BCPS, we serve 113,282 students. And we're almost ready for the video, but <laughs> not quite yet. <laughs> I'll keep going. BCPS serves 113,282 students, of whom 44% are eligible for free and reduced meals. They are, our students are from 117 countries, which are represented, and 94 languages are spoken. So again, we have a rapidly growing second language population, and each year students are entering kindergarten less prepared than they had the year before. The graduation rate has continued to climb, while at the same time, we have closed the gap in the graduation rate for African, between African American and white students. Are we back on track? We are. So in terms of this slide, we are a wonderfully and beautifully diverse school system. The pie chart on the left shows you 
um, uh, gives you a, a snapshot of BCPS in 1986. That was right around the time when I was in high school. <laughs> and the snapshot on the right shows you BCPS's enrollment today. So as you can see, we are currently, again, beautifully diverse as a majority minority school system. With regard to enrollment, enrollment increased by 1,143 students as of September 30th, 2017. Additionally, BCPS has seen a 39% increase in the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals over the past decade. Several student populations requiring the most intensive support grew much faster in, than overall enrollment. These students require greater support and specially trained staff. As I stated previously, BCPS now serves significantly more students with disability, including students who are autistic, students who have developmental delays, and students with multiple disabilities, more than we had five years ago. BCPS's FY19 budget continues to add instructional positions dedicated to the support of our students with disabilities. Special education has grown as a percent of, as a percent of the overall population. We are taking a thoughtful and a multi-year phase-in approach to allow us to hire more qualified, highly qualified, and high-demand staff over the next several years. So in FY17, we added 19 special education teachers and one board-certified behavioral analyst, which is a BCBA that you've heard many of our stakeholders speak to before. And FY18, we hired 14 special ed teachers and one BCBA. In this proposal, I am proposing that for the FY19 um, budget, that we hire 40 FTEs in this proposed budget, 16 teachers to improve ratios in the elementary schools, four teachers dedicated to the infants and toddlers program, 11.5 teachers for secondary schools to reduce caseloads and to improve service delivery, three board-certified behavioral analysts to provide expertise uh, to school-based staff, 3.5 transition facilitators to provide enhanced transition services to students and families in schools, and two paraeducators to serve as job coaches to provide trained coverage to enclave sites. In terms of English learners, our English learners increased by 132.3% over the past 10 years and, as you can see from the slide here, grew an additional 217 just over the past two months. Within that group, the system saw a decline in the proportion of English learners mastering English. Growth of our L's has exceeded over the overall growth in enrollment by almost 12 times over the past five years from FY13 to FY18, from 67.3% versus 5.8%. Spanish speakers have grown even faster. Spanish speaking L's are the largest subgroup and their graduation rate has also lagged. Beginning in FY16, the ESOL program began a multi-year phased expansion and we would like to continue that multi-year phased expansion. In FY 16, 17, 18, 10.3, 26.6, .6, and 17.0 ESOL positions, respectively, were added to the budget. For FY 19, 18 ESOL positions are proposed in this budget. 15 elementary and secondary teachers to improve ESOL student to teacher ratios and support and to support additional enrollment. Two ESOL social workers, including one for the community school, and one ESOL teacher to work as a family school liaison. The BCPS student population represents, again, 94 languages and 117 countries. So in summary, for special education and for our English learners alone, we will propose additional staff over the next several years to address the concerns that we hear com repeatedly from the community. We hear you and we are making progress. We are taking, again, a thoughtful approach 
and a multi-year phased-in approach to allow us to hire more of these high-quality, high-demand staff over the next several years. This portion of the proposal requests 58 FTEs um, and additional staff, and to address the concerns, again, that we've heard from our teachers, our students, our parents, and our community members. When it comes to enrollment, BCPS continues to uh, realize strong enrollment growth. In FY18, there was an increase again of 1,143 1, students as of September 30th. And BCPS expects continued growth in its student population, including a projected increase of 1,088 students in September of 2018, which is the FY19 school year, following an increase again of 1143 this past September. When it comes to growth and infrastructure, which is another priority of this budget, I'd like to highlight a two, the 2% 2 COLA or cost of living adjustment and step increases in accordance with the three-year collective bargaining agreements signed with all bargaining units and groups for the FY17 through the FY19 school years. These include teaching positions. We have 80 additional teaching positions. Again, it is our responsibility to make sure that every single one of our students has the benefit of a high quality teacher in front of them. So all, and so we have families that continue to choose Baltimore County and we want to make sure that we're account, uh, accommodating that by inc increasing our staffing by 80 teachers to uh, accommodate every child having a high quality teacher. We also have to take into account that we're opening a new Northeast Area Elementary School. So we need to make sure that we have the staffing to properly staff that elementary school as well. So when it comes again to the service support model and when we talk when we're talking about schools at the center, our people are a large part of this BCPS story. And I often speak and, and I often speak of the people that we need to support students, but we also need to talk about people who we need to support our overall organization and our system. So that also lends itself to our growth and infrastructure needs. So to that end, transportation, facilities, and maintenance staff additions have not kept up with the increases that we've seen in student enrollment. From FY07 to FY18, we've added approximately 1 million square feet of building area under our management, which is an increase of about 6%. So when I talk about people for our people, just like in the instructional area, we need to support operations as well to keep our schools running smoothly. So when it comes to that, we're talking about additional contract bus routes to make sure that all of our students get to school in a timely fashion and we can take care of overcrowding on some of our buses. We need to make sure that we're highlighting transportation support, transportation maintenance, and the maintenance of our trucks for facilities and technology um, departments as well. When it comes to the additional growth, we'll also need additional custodial and maintenance support. We know that our utilities costs are also um, of paramount importance for us to cover. And when it comes to school-based AV equipment, we need to make sure that we're accommodating our, sc our schools with their instructional needs as well. When it comes to technology, infrastructure, and maintenance, and our financial system upgrades, we need to keep up with to our changes technologies to make sure that we're running our school system efficiently. So in terms of our theory of actions, we've reviewed our budget priorities um, and what they are. Um, you've seen what our students will face, what the data tells us, what our system looks like, and what we need in order to manage our schools. So now it's time to turn to the why and the how of the budget process. Our theory of action states that as a system, for every student, we will provide an equitable, effective digital learning environment, and that will also provide equitable access to learning and developing a second language. I believe that to meet the theory of action, we need to steep our efforts in literacy and in school climate. 
So what does it mean to lead for literacy? Just uh, very briefly, I just would like to review that authentic literacy is integral to both what and how we teach. And as Schmoker said, it is the spine that holds everything together in all subject areas. Literacy is still the unrivaled but grossly underimplemented key to learning both content and thinking skills. When it comes to our early learners, we know what the data tells us. Our early learners, our kindergartners, are coming to us less prepared than they had in the past. So we'll need additional resources in order to catch them up. What that means, particularly for our primary teachers, is that they will need all resources available to them, sometimes to do double and triple jumps in student achievement for our youngest learners. So what does literacy look like? Teaching students how to read, write, and think like professionals in every field. It also looks like reading and writing across the disciplines in school every day, and analyzing and evaluating written material, graphs, charts, images, and videos. So in terms of the budget as it relates to literacy, we want to start with our early and our youngest learners. So again, we're looking at a continued pre-kindergarten expansion. This continued expansion will help us to reach approximately 220 more students, uh, pre-K students. In terms of a passport expansion, we're looking to expand by five additional teachers so that we can have a slow, responsible, measured rollout of our passport program. We know that rec recruitment is key when it comes to making sure that we have the teachers on board for our passport program. <coughs> We also, again, according to our magnet school, um, a magnet study that had been done some time ago in our magnet task force, we're looking at a magnet school expansion um, program. And we're looking to support our GT program by including additional resources and resource teachers in our GT and our advanced academics office. We heard just tonight that we need to, again, shine a brighter light on gifted and talented education in Baltimore County. We know that it's going to be um, highlighted in terms of our SLAs and regulations. So this is an opportunity for us to shine a brighter light on our gifted and talented students. And for students who need a non-traditional approach to teaching and learning, again, this is an investment in e-learning teachers and software for students who may not be able to have the benefit of a, of a traditional sit-in classroom experience. We also need to invest in college readiness, and we know that we've gotten a lot of progress and results when it comes to our AVID program. This um, uh, budget will also account for 8.4 additional teachers for our AVID program to expand into the middle schools and to round out our middle schools. And when it comes to the STAT final phase in, this year digital learning devices are being used for all grades in every elementary and middle school and for the second year in grades 9 through 12 our, in, our, in our three of our Lighthouse high schools. In FY19, the program will be completed in all grades in every school. The mid-year evaluation of our four of year four of the program will be presented to the board's curriculum committee in February of 2018. And the four-year final evaluation is scheduled to be presented to the board prior to the start of the school year in 2018-19. Again, it is essential that we continue to provide the resources, essential resources, particularly for our high school students when it comes to not just access of resources, but it's also access of opportunities as students are completing their college applications, they're completing their employment applications. They're looking forward to all kinds of opportunities that they can access online. <coughs> so, pardon me. So we want to make sure that we have that students who are matriculating from the middle school to the high schools, that we have continuity of instruction as well. In terms of instructional materials and resources, we want to make sure that we are continuing to invest in our resources as well. Thank you. Mm. My, my, my winter cold is starting to catch up with me. Don't worry, I'm almost finished. <laughs> but we, we need to make sure that we're highlighting the balance of digital and print material, as well as highlighting all of the additional resources to support, for instance, our next generation science standards to make sure that our students have the benefit of science kits and materials that they need to, to do well on those science standards.
When it comes to leading for climate, uh, climate is how we feel in school. We know that a positive school climate helps students achieve and learn and grow more. So when it comes to climate, we're, we always think about climate in three aspects, um, prevention, restoration, and logical consequences. There is no better deterrent for problematic behavior than a highly effective instruction. Every uh, effective teacher knows that the, w the best way to deter problematic behavior is through effective instruction. And so we want to continue to invest in inf effective instruction. We also need to teach students how to behave in socially acceptable ways. And that's through restoration. We teach them the language and skills that they need in order to work well with one another and to hold each other accountable for behavior. And we also have logical consequences so that when students students continue to act out, we do make sure that they are held accountable for their behavior. So when it comes to the budget aspect of school climate, we need to make sure that we're not throwing kids away, but we're providing those wraparound um, supports for our students. This budget proposal pr invests in wraparound services for our students by investing in additional school counselors, making sure that our families have the benefit of social work support as well. And we are looking at school climate and core-based support teams to work in in each zone to make sure that we're looking at ways in which kids, we can prevent dropouts, we can make sure that students are behaving and that we're supporting our teachers with professional development as it relates to behavioral supports. We're also looking at um, behavioral interventionists and psychologists and the, uh, the investment in psychologists. And when I speak about the psychologists, I'm speaking directly of psychologists to support our ESOL program and our English learners. We'll have um, one, of the, one of the psychologists will be specifically designated to work with students who have dyslexia and students who, who have been diagnosed with autism. Again, using a laser-like focus in order to, to hone in our budget on our specific needs of our system. We also note that in, or, in terms of school climate, we need to make sure that our students are safe from the time they leave their doors to the, to the time they enter ours and back home. That means an investment in additional bus attendance to make sure that students are behaving properly on school, and, on school buses and that they have a safe um, travel to and from school. We also need to make sure that we're providing additional health support um, in, in terms of health assistance that are needed in our schools. Athletic coaches and trainers, many times um, the programs that are held after school hours are overlooked, but we need to make sure that our students have the benefit of athletic trainers just in case they get hurt on those fields, that we have someone who can support them and we have someone who can attend to them. And we need to make sure that we continue to invest in our visitor identification system so that all of the folks who are walking through our buildings are those who are providing safety and that we know that they are um, only there for positive reasons in our schools. So when it comes to the operating budget in summary, this proposed budget represents funding of 7.5% above the maintenance of effort lef levels versus the 2.6% in the FY18 budget and an average annual increase of 0.3% between the FY11 and FY17 school years. This slide that you see about the FY19, the all funds slide, this slide represents the total amounts related to general funds and special revenue funds, such as uh, our grants related to the IED, IDEA grants and our Title I grant funds, and gives you a summary of the, our proposal as well. So I just have to go back to our premise for this budget. Again, when we speak about people for our people, um, these are our focal points for this, um, for this budget, and now you know why I was so excited in the beginning. When I talk about those areas of need that we get to address, this is an opportunity um, for our community and for our teachers and for all of our administrators, those who have been talking to me all summer, this is an opportunity for us to advocate for what we really 
need. We need essential resources in our schools, but we, we also must invest in our most precious resources, which are our people, and this budget highlights just that. So as you, as you can see from the pie chart here, you can see that the majority of our budget is focused on on the growth and infrastructure. And when I say growth and infrastructure, I'm talking about our um, steps and um, cost of living increases for our well-deserving staff, as well as looking at the growth of our system. Again, our families are choosing BCPS, and so we have to accommodate for that growth. So you can see in those two green areas that, that those areas make up 69.5% of this proposal. Our special ed and ESOL uh, proposal makes up 3.6% of the budget, and our school climate makes up 5.5% of the budget, and our literacy uh, portion makes up 21.4% of the budget. Again, I would like to thank everyone who has uh, who have contributed to this proposal, and special thanks to again Kevin Smith, George Saris, Witt, and to the team um, for uh, again for your help in developing and putting together and composing this. Um, I believe this wonderful budget proposal, and certainly um, I could summarize this budget, but I know that it's just to give everyone a fuller picture of what this might look like in the classroom. Our star video today. Um, it does just that and I think can do a better job than I can. Our strongest investment as a county is our public schools. A student needs to graduate not only with a high school diploma. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Take two. Grow. <laughs> 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 Turn your microphone on, David. <laughs> Sources and technology are also necessary but there is no substitute for personalized support from our leaders and staff. So today we have a real world problem that we're gonna be solving. Oh, oh. Uh -oh. Our strongest investment as a county is our public schools. Every BCPS student needs to graduate not only with a high school diploma, but also a resume in order to be prepared for the demands of college and career. Doorknob to allow for uh, increased capability for the user. More families continue to choose our schools, and as we grow, we have to provide people for our people. Programs, resources, and technology are also necessary, but there is no substitute for personalized support from our leaders and staff. So today we have a real world problem that we're gonna be solving. Our focus on literacy across the subject areas is helping students learn how to read, write, and think like professionals. We demonstrate literacy throughout the school day by reading, writing, and speaking. By, for example, just the other day in ELA, we were learning about frogs. We learned about their life cycle, habitat, and what they eat. We read about, spoke about, and wrote about frogs. In <laughs> fact, it was like doing science at the same time. Safe and orderly school climates provide learning environments where students feel welcome and are supported to do their best. In order for children to learn, they have to be safe. If they're safe, they will exceed and excel in everything they do. A teacher has to make this feel like a second home, a place where kids are welcomed and take risk. They need to be excited about learning, engaged in learning, and just have fun. Students and teachers continue to be the heart of this organization. As Team BCPS continues to grow, we must invest in our people and our infrastructure so our students can achieve academic success.
Oh, let's see if I can get this work. Okay. So again, you have some key dates, and I'm not sure if we can toggle back to that slide with the key dates, um, where we have a public hearing, um, and we do invite the the public to uh, to lend your voices, to continue to lend your voices to this um, budget process. And again, Mr. Chair, that is our FY19 operating budget proposal. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, the important dates are one week from tonight uh, is the public hearing, and board members are uh, asked to provide uh, their questions and comments by that same date to the administration so the administration can put together uh, responses in advance of our work session, which will be at our next meeting. So, thank you, Ms. White. That's quite a presentation. <laughs> it's probably worth more than one bottle of water. <laughs> Um, next on our agenda is uh, board member comments, and we'll start with Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Earlier, a couple people referenced Georgie Clevenger, um, the P PTA Council Secretary. Also, I'd like to mention, you know, during that same time frame that, you know, the chief custodian at Franklin Elementary passed. So while a lot of us were having joyous times, there were some families that were, you know, missing their loved one. You know, grandma, grandpa was gone. But, you know, that's not the only challenges that people in our, our county face also, you know, our homeless population and those who are hungry. Additionally, um, I will say that Tomorrow, our General Assembly goes back to work. One thing of particular interest should be the fact that this year, spring break will be more of a weekend. So if parents are concerned about that short time frame, particularly for high schoolers who will be having final exams shortly thereafter, they should reach out to their legislators and ask for the return of local control of the calendar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Mrs. Hen. This is the first, and my mic is not on. Okay, I resolved to have my mic on for future comments this year. Um, we often focus on what is not working well within our system, and one of my resolutions this year is to focus on what is working well and what needs to um, be expanded. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Russ Brown um, on the boundary study process and his team. That is an example of, a stellar example of how public input is used to make our system better. It's a process I know that involves a lot of hard work, a lot of staff time, and it's one to be applauded. Um, it's a process that I believe we can learn from to apply to other areas and projects such as new school planning. Um, feedback from the community is that they would like additional opportunities to provide input early on into new school construction projects being one, and that process is working well and is one that, that can be expanded. So I want to thank you, Dr. Brown, um, and your team for um, really fine-tuning that process. It's one that I've been able to observe with the new Northeast Area Elementary um, School and one which I hope can be adopted in other areas of operations to give the public a voice. So thank you. Mr. Virch. Um, thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Mike. Uh, it is on. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Um, first, um, just want to let you all know that our um, general counsel for the system has lost her voice. Um, but um, we all hope she'll get it back and return, and um, she just does a tremendous job for us on the Policy Review Committee, tireless worker. Um, for our librarians and our, um, our media specialists, uh, many of whom like to be called librarians, I like the term as well, uh, what do board members read? Well, I'm reading Code Girls, the untold story of American women code breakers. Now, currently we talk about code, we talk about software and programming. Well, I've always liked cryptanalysis, and these code uh, breakers uh, were folks who worked during World War II. 10,000 American women worked on breaking codes, transmissions of those who would do us in during the war, and they created the early culture of the National Security Agency, which of course is located here in Maryland. Uh, I note tomorrow evening, speaking of 
code. Parent University will have an event at our Martin Boulevard Elementary School in our 6th District. It is a family code night. So please come and, and, and do code. Uh, last month I was at Kenwood Communicates at our Kenwood High School, an event planned for students and staff and parents, and as it turned out, certain uh, alums of the school uh, to go and listen to our students and our staff and other folks. It's really a unique thing to get to, to be in our schools to listen firsthand as opposed to a uh, more structured formal environment. And there's good opportunities for follow-up as opposed to having to move to the next agenda item. Um, I also went to our Middle River Middle School. Um, Shannon Parker, the principal, uh, one of the vice principals, uh, Lori Howell, uh, for a number of winter concerts. And if you get a chance uh, when the spring rolls around to go to any of these, you really ought to. It's, it's really neat to sit and listen. And as I do, go up and talk to different parents just at random and to hear what they have to, to say about their kids and their future and their hopes. Um, I went to Vincent Farm for a book fair uh, all the cocoa you could ever want to drink. Mm. Um, and I went to, uh, to sort of bookend this, so to speak, I went to our Elmwood Elementary School for another book fair. And during an earlier tour at our Fullerton Elementary in our 6th District with Candace Winterson, the principal, uh, Mrs. McNulty, one of our elementary school principals, was talking to me about reading, and she suggested a book that I read by uh, Patricia Palacco called Thank You, Mr. Falker, and it's about a student who has difficulties reading, and she doesn't understand why she has these difficulties, but the special person in her life, a teacher, identifies what is um, the cause of these difficulties, and it is a story with a happy ending, and that's why it has this title, because it is written, of course, uh, to thank Mr. Falker, the character, for um, helping the student understand and then to achieve in reading. Um, so those are uh, what oh, at least one board member has been reading, and I was able actually to read that at our Elmwood Elementary School during the book fair. Uh, the folks in the library were able to pull it, and I was able to sit there and read it before I then went over and met Mr. and Mrs. Claus. And I leave you with that. Thank you, Ed. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, a number of times this evening, um, events uh, across the state of, the Mar of Maryland have been mentioned that affect education, certainly in Baltimore County. The legislative session that Mr. Young mentioned, the Kerwin Commission that Ms. Bergman mentioned, uh, the Knott Commission that's working on school construction standards. And I just wanted to mention one other effort that's underway with Dr. Salmon, our state superintendent leading, looking at graduation requirements for the state of Maryland, how park tests will be used and things like that. And as a member of MABE, I will be participating in that um, uh, task force that takes place from January through June. So I know many of you might have some thoughts or comments on that, and I would uh, appreciate you passing them on to me at any time, because that's uh, something that will Im impact all, all of our students, uh, high school and otherwise. So uh, thank you for that. Ms. Schaefer. Um, very quickly, the student the Superintendent Student Advisory Council will be meeting on Thursday on BCPS Blue Day. Um, very excited, we'll be talking about mental health and the operating budget. Um, also on our advisory council is Jamie Roa, who is a senior at Franklin, and she is selected to be in the United States Senate Youth Program, which is super cool. We're super proud of her, and I can't wait to see her on Thursday. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. So I just wanted to start by thanking our administration and thanking our community who came out for the Lansdowne High School uh, town hall discussion on the proposed renovation. It was a thorough, a extensive, and a thoughtful discussion. And so I'm very appreciative to our team, um, and I'm very appreciative to the community. Um, and the one thing that's most striking is that people are fundamentally honest and fundamentally focused towards improving the lives of kids and of that community. And we are working in the same direction on that score. And I continue to have the conversations with the community, which I appreciate, and that dialogue continues. Uh, it is appreciated. 
And then secondly, I have become aware um, that our neighbors to the south in Virginia and Prince William County are beginning the process of studying and trying to understand our transition in Baltimore County to standards-based uh, grading and our philosophies there, including uh, reviewing a manual, our manual, that has made a big impression in, uh, throughout their system. And so that, uh, that is, in, in my um, estimation, what leadership looks like. Um, it can be bold, it can have issues, but it really does make a splash and, and moves us towards the right direction. Thanks. Mr. Yulfelder. Thank you. Um, tonight, uh, several times we heard the word hunger. So I want to give a shout out uh, to Kevin Smith and his report uh, that stated that over the summer, the three summer months, uh, BCPS served 258,456 meals. Um, I'm going to ask the superintendent to put together a comprehensive report on all we do in BCPS uh, relative uh, to uh, hunger. Uh, we do a lot, and it's just not publicized, but certainly t t during the summer months to serve over 250,000 meals to kids is certainly something to be proud of. So I appreciate that. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to take this opportunity to say Happy New Year. Um, I just uh, also want to thank Pinewood Elementary School. My last uh, official BCPS event was to go and read to second graders. Um, and it was really a, a wonderful thing to do and a great way to end the year. It was encouraging to see such enthusiastic learners, and it's always um, wonderful to see our teachers and school administrators in the superb communities that they create for our students. Um, I was uh, pleased to be able to attend the TABCO and ESPBC Legislative Breakfast. Uh, it was um, amazing to be able to collaborate and speak with some of our teachers and our support staff. And it's always a nice opportunity to see our elected officials. Um, they do a great deal on behalf of public education for Baltimore County. So we wish them well and endurance as they persevere through the legislative session um, and just really appreciate what they do for education. Um, in a previous meeting, uh, the board had directed the interim superintendent to evaluate adding 15 minutes to each school day, and we look forward to hearing updates from the interim superintendent on this issue. Adding 15 minutes per day uh, would bring BCPS up to the state average length of the school day. And there's many benefits that this could include. Uh, additional instructional time, additional days available for spring break or other um, professional development days during the year, additional recess time for some of our younger learners, additional teacher planning time, depending on how those extra minutes are orchestrated during the day. It's also a way to pay our teachers for the time they already spend over and above their duty. It's also a way that we can increase our success in recruitment and retention of teachers by having more competitive salary within the state of Maryland. So I'm uh, encouraged by um, the board working together with the interim superintendent on that issue, and I look forward to hearing more. Um, earlier comments that I made were labeled incorrectly. I do feel that when we have a former school official, former, with ethics violations and that there is, when there is national media coverage of extensive travel and interactions with vendors and vendor-related organizations, when board members have had um, trouble receiving information that's requested, when we have vendor sales personnel coming into our schools with external visitors, educators from other districts, and interacting with BCPS staff on a frequent basis, I believe it is appropriate to ask how we can be confident that there is no undue vendor influence, nor the appearance of undue vendor influence. We must determine that we can spend every precious dollar in the best interest of our students. Um, I was very glad to hear the superintendent's budget um, addressed to us. I heard many positive elements, and I look forward to um, some special reading time to look through the rest of it, um, and then the future discussions that we're going to have. I also look forward to hearing from the public um, when we have our public hearing that the interim superintendent pointed out. And I just want to say that um, additionally, I want to thank the governor and the legislature for the record funding of public education that we've experienced throughout the state in the last three years. I also appreciate the governor introducing legislation recently for an inspector general of education statewide. I'm interested in hearing more of the details of that legislation. Um, I'm also looking forward this year to continuing the work of improving education for all of our students with our interim superintendent.
the rest of the board and all of our wonderful staff. Thank you. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I'm sorry that I missed the new Dundalk Elementary School presentation. I do have the PowerPoint, uh, the paper PowerPoint presentation to view. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Smith for working so hard on this project. And I would also like to thank Ms. White for um, putting in money for all the full-time teachers, especially for the counselors and social workers that are needed um, in our schools. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I had the uh, wonderful fortune of meeting yesterday the mother of Grace McComas, who inspired Grace's Law here in Maryland. Um, Grace McComas was the uh, victim of cyberbullying, and she committed suicide. Um, in October of 2013, our uh, state legislature enacted Grace's Law, and it was enacted in order to um, prohibit anyone from using electronic media, that includes phones, to maliciously engage in conduct that inflicts serious emotional distress on a minor and or places that minor in reasonable fear of death or serious bodily injury. A person who, who is found guilty of violating this law is subject to imprisonment up to a year and a fine of up to $500 or both. I think that very few people are aware of this law. I was not aware of it until I spoke with her. Um, so I, I want to let people know about it, let people know that there is another avenue here. Um, the website is graceslawmaryland.com, and on the back of this, I, I'm going to scan this and post this on my Facebook page um, and some other information. It says, in Maryland public schools, if you feel that you're being bullied, you have the right to report your concerns, and the school has the responsibility to investigate those concerns. And it lists here on this um, action items for parents, and it really underscores the need for parents to use the um, bullying, harassment, and intimidation form that is uh, a state-level form. Um, I speak to parents all the time concerned about issues with their children, and I ask them, did you, did you fill out the form, the bullying form? And so many times they say no. Uh, so I just want to underscore the importance of that, even if you think that it's futile. Fill out that form. It formally documents the incident. It goes in student records. It creates a paper trail. So it's very important. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out about Grace's Law. Mr. Hayden. I was impressed a little earlier to hear that one of the fellow, my fellow board members was talking about reading in one of the schools. And at the same time, I was crestfallen because uh, I was invited to one of the local uh, schools to read to the second graders and they rescinded the invitation when they found out I had trouble with the big words. So uh, I, I look. That's for, uh, that is unfortunate. <laughs> I, I, Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. You can't hear me? <laughs> Do I have to repeat that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that always concerns me about any group I've ever been involved with is when people uh, carry disagreements to the point where they can't get along with one another and they can't be civil to one another, uh, i.e. chuckling when somebody is talking about a very serious point to them. And when that happens, it really takes away from who we are and what we are. And, and, you know, we, we do get into, and I'm sure we, if we're going to be an effective board, we'll get into that uh, occurrence because that's what it's all about being on the board. If we all came in and all agreed and everybody voted the same way on everything, uh, there's no need for us. We're here to get our points across. 
We're here to share, and we're he here to try and talk people into our positions. Again, that's what it's all about. That's what democracy is all about. That's what America is all about. And I hope we can, we can all look forward in that direction as we move down the line here. Uh, and uh, my favorite line for many years uh, involvement uh, on the Board of Ed, uh, then and now, uh, and it's, I've resurrected it, is that kids are the bottom line. And kids are the bottom line, and it's so important that we all realize that in everything we do and all the efforts we make, they're to make kids better. And that's the same feeling that staff members uh, do, or if they don't, they should have, uh, and so we can move forward. And left out in the conversations this evening, uh, somewhere was uh, uh, the real appropriate spot to drop, drop it in, but we don't encourage our and thank our parents enough for everything that they do. Parents are so important to making things work properly and make sure that our kids have the best education they can possibly wish for. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, board will be right here again the next two Tuesdays. Next Tuesday, the 16th, for a public hearing on the operating budget, and the following Tuesday for our second meeting of the month, our work session. We're adjourned. <laughs>